Uh, thanks for uh, having me on, Matt. I think you're doing a great job with all these so far. I've loved listening My pleasure. to them and watching them. Um, I'm a street performer, have been since 1998. Oh, thank you. Um, I've always always loved street theatre. I've always always done many kinds of different ones. I was a, a dancer uh, for a while. I'm doing a stunt show now. And before that, and throughout it, really, I've been an athlete on the British athletics team. Uh, I was on the British bobsleigh team, property developer, landlord, wow. many different things, many different uh, hats, but enjoying the life again uh, as a street performer, doing something I really, really love. So you've lived a full life. Yeah, it's been a colourful one, definitely. Very colourful. Yeah. Which I think is always the case with all street performers, how they go. Well, I tell you, what, I'm very, very much in. Yeah, very much so. We are, uh, we're a colourful group. A lot of interesting stories from our community. It's been really nice actually managing to hear a lot of them and collect them. Yeah, definitely. It's an important task that you've yeah, you've taken upon yourself to do to get all these together. Uh, there's just so many. I didn't realise how diverse they were and how different people's journeys to get to where where they are and it's fascinating yeah. really is and so talking about journeys and where we get to let's begin with yours so i suppose you usually say how you begin performing but i think with your story being an athlete is is something which will be integral to it i imagine so let's start off by why you got into competing in sports um for me it was just one of those things where I was I was I was good at school. Um, started representing the the school at athletics, and it was it was it was at a time when I wasn't doing that great academically. So it, it was really something which was like, wow, I really enjoy this. Being good at something was was really enjoyable, and it gave you a real a real buzz. So for that reason, uh, I pursued it, and I was very lucky to be in a family, a very supportive family. So for me, I've got a, a mom who's. Uh, was a language teacher. Uh, she's all sorts. It's too hard to even concise her in one bracket, but she's just this wonderful, amazing woman who's so capable in so many different things. And she's done such a, a great job with, with being a mom. Um, but also, she's always been the one to say, if I've said, okay, I want to be a street performer, my mom would be the one to say, you're going to need this, you're going to need this, you're gonna... I'll make the costumes, I'll do this. And then dad, who's the civil engineer, He'd be the one to say, well, you're going to need some music. You know, we'll go to the scrapyard and get this. And, you know, the, no one said what are you are thinking about or why would you want to do that? And so it was just all it was like a flowing river, which was just constantly pushed and supported, you know, in, in everything. That's yeah. from all, all my brothers and my sister and anything we've ever wanted to do. We've been really lucky to have an environment where any dreams or ambitions have been allowed to grow and, and, and flourish in that, in that sense. And so well, what a great springboard, me, eh? Yeah, yeah, totally. Because I know some people have done it against the grain. For me, it was, it was, it was weird how it happened. With athletics, was an, an obvious thing. You just you represented your school. You got better at it. Um, I and did you doing... go and do club work? Did you go and go to a running club? Yeah, I was a gated harrier up in the northeast. Won the county championships. Ended up winning the national championships. Um, represent my country at the European championships as a junior. And so I was, I was one of the one of the best around for my age, um, age between 16 and 18, I was, I was really good for my age. It was then after that where it becomes difficult because then you've got to become established as a senior athlete. The hurdles get a lot higher and the, uh, the demands on the body. How many days a week were you training as a youngster? I just want to get an idea of how the commitment that you put towards this, because I, I did a little bit of athletics when I was young. I, I know the commitment that goes in for that, but I'd like everyone else to be able to hear that. Yeah. Um, well, as a, as a youngster, I was never too keen on the training, I must admit. Rob, my older brother, he's a year older, was a pole vaulter. He used to really be a great trainer. He could train really well. I used to rely a lot on natural ability i think and i didn't used to like train so much but then it got to the age at about 16 17 where but you when you say not so much you still mean two or three days a week am i right in thinking that probably a couple of days yeah tuesdays thursdays was about all yeah. mom and dad could get me there after that it was it was just down there. because at the time you see you've still got you've got pe you've got games lessons you've got rugby you've got football you've got uh although my school, there wasn't a great deal of football. There was a lot of rugby. And then you got athletics, sports days, all the rest of it. So there was a whole enormous amount of activity as a kid. 
And then, of course, you've got the athletics on top on a Tuesday and Thursday. So, yeah. yeah it was, Are you doing a couple of hours, something like that? Yeah, you don't, you didn't, we didn't need too much. By the time you've warmed up and warmed down, probably a couple of hours, you know, six and to eight, were you, that was about Were it. you pushing yourself? Were you go when you were at the training, did you commit there and were you pushing yourself to the point of exhaustion and past that? Not so much as a, as, as, a, as a younger athlete, but certainly as an adult, we got used to being out of that comfort zone where, you, you know, you'd be being sick after training and pushing through the lactic threshold and really demanding the most of yourself and being around people who were better than you in order for to, 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 to know I want to be as good as that. That's how I've got to train and pushing yourself, trying to constantly push yourself to the point of almost breakdown, you know? Yeah, and so... What was it like to go and do the European Championships then as a young man? That was really exciting. Any time I got to represent Great Britain was amazing because just the the athletics, you're never part of it. You're, it's always an individual thing. You know, you're always on your own. You're always going away. You're always, you know, the amount of times and memories of mom and dad driving me hours and hours and hours down to Birmingham for eight seconds, you know, just to have that one race or eight seconds or 10 seconds or 12 seconds. And it's just pure seconds. You know, you never really get full value for money. But when you go away but with did the you... British team, it's, yes. uh, you, you know, you're, that whole feeling of hearing the open ceremonies and seeing you know, that the, the likes of Dwayne Chambers, who obviously went on to a good career, although be it a checkered one. Christian Malcolm, who's now just been today or yesterday, be as now the head of UK athletics. And he was they were in the same team as me. It was, it was a great team, a great year, quite a, a good year for, for athletics. And it was just amazing to yeah. see these athletes perform at that level. And were you nervous? Was it a was it a, a scary experience going through that and having the pressure? Because it's a lot of pressure. If you're sat in the blocks, you're waiting for the gun to go, or if you're in the dressing room waiting to get out there, trying to be of right mind. Yeah, I mean the the adrenaline and the pressure is huge. When I look back now to the pressure as a on a young athlete, and you think, wow, to be able to do it, to put yourself through that. It was only years later when I realised, you know what, I actually must have. I, I really enjoy that. That's where I'm really in my peak state is when there's a lot of pressure on me. And I really feel like you, you're against the odds. You've got to overcome something. And that's where I feel like my brain is, is at its most peaceful or it's at its best there, you know. And, um, but, yeah, when you look back, the pressure on, on kids, especially at the national championships, the English schools, wow, they were, they were like the, your Olympics, you know. And the size of it, when you're 14 to 16 and the other guys are more developed, so they're like grown men. They look like they should have their, their kids in the stands, you know, and they've got hair in places you haven't got, and they've got beards, and uh, you think, wow, this, this, this is like a... But then, it, of course, as you get older, the gap reduces, and everyone levels out more or less, you know, in terms of development. And then it comes really down to not who's the most talented, who's the most developed, but it comes down to look who can train the best, who can train the smartest, and who can put it together in the big, big championships. And so... Um, when you start street performing, is this when you're an adult athlete? Have you already been an adult athlete some time? Or No, what happened was I remember doing my A-levels and I, uh, I, I suddenly learned quite late in the game with GCSEs and A-levels that, that they weren't as hard as I thought they had been. I struggled at school. I was at, uh, at the Royal Grammar School in Castle. It was a uh, private school. It was a, a very high standard school. And I did struggle with the speed of the learning. I could go through a two-hour lesson. All the other kids had pages and pages of notes, and I'd have nothing written down. And every report would say, you know, Liam's a dreamer, not quite sure where he is in the lessons. Sports going great. Academically could do better, could do better. So I just became used to, you know what, I'm probably just not that good academically. That's just me. I'm going to have to really make it work as an athlete. But then as I started to cram and revise and start to teach myself and literally teach myself, it wasn't revision, it was teaching myself these subjects, which I'd just been absent on in lessons. But obviously some part of my brain had been there. So there was, it wasn't totally from scratch, but I suddenly started to click and I started to think, you know what, these aren't that hard. These are, especially GCSEs, they were more memory tasks. And then even when it got to A-level, I thought, wow, these, I think I can do all right at these. And ended up doing a lot better. And what did you decide to do in your A-levels? I did psychology. I left the Royal Grammar School because I was, I was having a hard time. I was doing classical civilization, chemistry, and art. And it was too much of a different brain going into one than the other. It was like left side, right side, left. Constant change. And it was just very stressful. So I left school. I went to um, Guyana, where my dad was working for a while. I had 
eight or nine near death experiences, which I'll tell you about in a second, which are crazy. Yeah. And then when I came back, I went to Timemouth College where I, 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 it was great because I'd been in an all boys school. I'd never have that balance of mixed school. You know, suddenly there was girls there and it was normal. And people were asking me to see my homework. And I was like, quite like this. I'm kind of the SWAT here. And it did so much wonders for my confidence. So I did psychology, art, sorry, psychology, media studies, and sports studies. The three things I loved. I loved the, I loved the media and why things are the way they are. I loved the psychology of behavior. And I loved the sports stuff. So I ended up getting three A's, which I didn't need to get. I only needed three C's for Loughborough. But in pure panic and fear of not being good enough or not getting it, combined with this new confidence of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all right. I'm not, I'm not the thick kid. And so mm-hmm. I did, I did well. And when I, when I got those results, I remember I, me and my brother, a couple of the lads had gone and we bought a motorhome, toured around Europe one summer. And I was on the beach, literally going, walking towards the phone booth, phoning home to get the results, thinking, will I get the C's? And my mom could hardly speak. You know, she said, they've called us in you've, and you've won an award. Because it was the same time. It was all going well at once. It was, I'd won the English schools. I was representing Britain in athletics. And I uh, had a girlfriend at the time, so I was balancing all this. And I'd, I'd got the three A's. I'd won an award for academics as well. It was just so much to take in. It was like, it showed me at such a young age, at 18, time management, the ability. You, you, it was like, it was this alarm, this sudden awakening of, I wonder what else I can do. Like, this is what I've done when applying myself. I've never been this guy, you know, and it was suddenly a new, this confidence. So it just, in a good way, and it was a bad way as well, because as a young boy, your ego grows, you know, and with that becomes problems as well. But it was certainly a good thing being able to know, I wonder what I can do. So I ended up dropping out of Loughborough, where I was supposed to do sports studies. And I, I phoned them and said, look, I, I don't actually want to do sports studies. I really wanted to do media. And I've now got these grades. And they said, well, you can do, but you'll have to take But uh- You'd have to take a year off. But I assume Loughborough is a sports college, right? It, Loughborough's focus is sports. It's, uh, it's, it is red brick. I mean, it's, they've got aeronautical engineering. It's, it's right up there on the red bricks now. But for years, back then, this is 98, it was predominantly sport. You know, it was where people went. It was where Seb Coe went. It was where you went if you wanted to be on the Olympic team. And so that was my focus. I wanted to be there to, to get to the Olympics. And, uh, and the media studies course was also great because it, was only, it wasn't that many hours per week of actual compulsory time, which I liked. I mean, I could spend more time teaching myself, which I'd realize now, I don't think I'm very good at being taught stuff. You know, I think I need to be the one to get into the books and teach myself a lot of this stuff. And I realized then that, that's what I needed to do. So I called my coach and he said, well, you'll need to take a year off. And I thought, well, what am I going to do for a year? So I'd contact an old friend. I went to see my dad. Guyana, and then I contacted an old friend in Reno, Nevada, who was a coach, NCAA national champion decathlete, and he said, why don't you come over here to Nevada, to Reno, and I'll coach you, and we'll get you to the world championships. And I What a great thought, gap year. Yeah, I was, dead. I was dead naive. I just thought you could just fly to America, and just maybe I'd get a job, maybe I wouldn't. I had no clue really how I was going to do it. But so then my, 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 my auntie, uh, Tina, um, she got yeah. in touch with she got in touch with the American embassy and they got back and they said, look, you, you need to have five grand in your account in order to go to America. You can't, we're not going to give you a work visa, so you need to have that money. Now, knowing what we know now, we probably would have just shuffled things around, borrowed some, got some here, showed them, there we go, there we go, yeah. and then hustled it over there. But back then, it was a case of, okay, well, that means I've got to go out and make that money. How am I going to do it? Now, at the time, to put it into context, the year before... I'd been working in bars and clubs as a 70s dancer, as a John Travolta impersonator. Okay. Um, and were you always a dancer? Did you do it as a young person or was it something you learned no, to do that? No, I've never had any formal training. So I just, uh, I lo- but I did love dancing. A bit like anyone really. I mean, we all had to go with the Michael Jackson thing and, uh, you know, figure we can do it. And I just, yeah, I loved dancing. It was another way for me to express myself. And when I think this is what happened. I didn't realize why I loved 70s disco music at the time so much. But when my mom came in to watch me one night dancing, she goes, you do realize nearly all the tracks you've picked to dance to are the tracks that I used to play on my 70s keep fit class in, in the Middle East where we lived. And you used to sit in the corner of the room and listen to them all day long. So I was like, well, now it makes sense why I picked these same songs, you know, big, big anthems. So I, I used to love it. And, and the UK was going through this big revival of 70s and all this stuff. So... 
So I ended up um, um, I ended up saying, well, what if I take what I'm doing in the clubs and do it on the street? It was dead weird. I always remember this. I was I was I remember distinctly. It was either, it was sometime while I was doing A levels, and I did this little doodle, and it came out of nowhere. And I drew this stick man. It was me in my 70s get up and then there was people around clapping and I had a sound system and I didn't even really know what I'd drawn but then the thought came street performing and it's dead weird because I'd never seen a street performer in my life I'd never seen one that's out I'd never maybe I might have seen one as a kid in London but I didn't even know they existed outside yeah. of London so I contacted my well I was from the Midlands so I can empathize with that like in Newcastle yeah. or wherever you know you don't see much of that stuff you particularly then even now like at, when i'm performing yeah. these places i never see other circle acts or performers it's still a rare thing so i contacted my cousin again uh, or my auntie um and she she said uh, look i'll look into it she came back and she said i remember i still got the letter somewhere that says it's not illegal but it's not legal you've kind of just got to have a go so i said right okay so again dad helped me build a buskin box i got my grandma's shopping trolley i got a car amplifier speakers uh, motorbike battery, tiny little lead acid one, a tape res- cassette recorder, and a, a roll of lino. And I went to the streets. And my mom came down, my girlfriend at the time came down on the train. And we went out there. And I remember my show was a, literally about four minutes long, four or five minutes long of me just doing some dance moves, a bit of disco dancing. And I definitely wouldn't want to see any recordings of it now. But, you know, <laughs> I, I must have had the confidence still to think, I'm all right, see, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, you know? And uh, people, when yeah. people are watching, it's that feeling of they're watching, I must be good. Well, not necessarily, but it definitely gave me the confidence. And I think that day, I remember we counted it out in KFC at the end. And it was kind of this defining moment of, wow, that's quite a chunk of money for like, you've never done this in your life before and you've just had a go. And so after that, my mom and dad uh, went back up home on the bus and I stayed down there. And every day, my aim was, I've got to raise the money to get this five grand to get to America, to get the coaching, because there was no lottery funding for UK. I've got to get the best coaching to get to the World Championships. And every day, I was earning a bit, earning a bit, got robbed one day, Leicester Square. Uh, the only time I've ever been robbed, actually. But then it, was, it wasn't really getting there. I remember one day, I went commando, had no boxer shorts on, and for no other reason than just... I just didn't have any, probably didn't have any clean. I had these bottle green yeah. nylon tight flares, platforms, Afro wig, sideburns. I mean, I literally did not really want to see the audience. I needed to hide behind something, you know. And so I had these masks as well. I had a John Travolta mask. That was about it. Tiny little thing. They got bigger with, with over and the years. Was it, was it with a bit of bit of string, yeah, like the old paper of, masks yeah, with a bit of string a bit, around? A bit of string. Yeah. And there was no real structure. But and so was this a development of the act? Was yeah, this developing yeah. from the first day you did it? You went, okay, I'll get a mask. I'll put yep. this in. I'll put that in. Yeah, that was it. Literally just every day going back to the drawboard thing. And that, was, that song was too long. That was a bit short. Adding a bit in, a little bit of editing with the tape recorders. And then it became mini discs. And it, it evolved over the week of the two weeks, few weeks quite quickly. It's it so still... interesting because you're evolving this in a vacuum. Most people Total. who I talk to they perform with other people and they watch somebody else and they go, Oh, that's how this works. But you've, you performed on your own and slowly were much like you're learning, sitting, working it out by yourself. Yeah. Um, well, I, I will say this when I went to Leicester square, the performers who were there, there was a lad called Robin who was a bit of an acrobat and did a bit of a silver robot. There was a guy called Charlie. Do you remember Charlie who did the, he just did, he had rubber chickens and all sorts of weird stuff and oh i've not seen charlie i don't know there was bruno there was bruno the singer on the corner and they were all really supportive you know absolutely and there was silver the guy who was from scotland who does the silver shoes it's got a silver man yeah he was there he was there and it was it was just a graham scott if anyone wants to check his one okay um but it was just this amazing new hey look at this life this is a whole subculture this is a whole world and you're just I was just dipping into it for a purpose. I literally had no interest in being a street performer. It, it just re- evolved as a way of this is how I'm going to get the money for what I want. And Means one to an day, end. Exactly. And so I, it was one day I came in, flares, commando. I was doing the Russian Cossacks, split my pants. I'm thinking nightmare. So I grabbed my stuff, I'm th- pack it up for the day. 
and I think I, by this point I was doing a bit of Michael Jackson as well I had a Michael Jackson latex mask and I didn't realize that a guy called Tommy Lloyd who was the director of Ladbrokes and he'd seen my show and he'd gone in and he thought, I like that guy. I'm going to ask him when I come out. Gone in for a meal in Leicester Square. He'd come out. He was going to ask me to perform at the opening night of his new casino in Tottenham Court Road. And the only way they'd been given, dead serendipitous, the only way he'd been given permission to open a casino and license was if he did it in conjunction with a charity. And he had chosen the Sports Aid Foundation, who help young athletes. But he knew nothing about me being an athlete. He'd just seen me doing Michael Jackson and he had a share impersonator, Tina Turner, and he wanted me to do it. Anyway, when he came out, I'd split my trousers. I'd got on the tube and gone. So he thought, oh, well, you know, I'll never see him again. The next day, he opens the Evening Standard, and there's a big article, Earth, Wind, and Flyer, about... <laughs> there you go. Uh, Evening Standard, classic one. And they said, what our British Olympic hopefuls are doing to try to get to the Olympics. This is Liam Collins and his stories, trying to raise money to get to America because he can't get the support he feels he needs. In Britain, and, and I take you engaged with this. You, some reporter had come up to you and asked you, "Will you do a story with us?" Yeah, it was a guy. I think he was called David Powell, and he came up. He saw saw me there. Was interested, in, and I think, oh, what was it? Or it might have actually been my auntie who contacted them just to see, look, is there anything you can do? I think she did. I think she contacted them. And said, is there anything you can do? He thought it was an interesting story, and so it was all over. You know what it's like on the evening train. It's the evening. Everyone's reading the evening standard. Uh, so this Tommy Lloyd guy reads it and, he, go, uh, and, he, and he, um, he sees it and he says, wow, this guy is actually an athlete and we've opened the casino in conjunction. So he says, I know what I'm going to do. So by this point, I got ill. I went back up to Newcastle. I'd pretty much thrown the towel in of I don't think I'm going to get to America. And then my, I was in bed and my grandma says, hey, Liam, um, Tina's on the phone. OK. I get on the phone. She says, a guy's seen you. And he saw the paper and he wants you to perform at the opening night of the casino at the Earth Galleries of the National History Museum in London. And they're going to give you the full five thousand pounds to go to America. And then they're going to put you up at the Hilton, which they owned at the time. And they're going to fly you there. And I was like, this is crazy, really? And they're like, yeah, all you've got to do is do your seven minute routine on the opening night. And then so this was so exciting, you know, and looking at the guest list, it was the. It was the British. Uh, there was the British rugby team. There was Formula One guys, Damon Hill. There was all the British celebrity sportsmen and women. And I idolised these people as a kid. I mean, it, this was the days in athletics where nowadays it's it's t a little bit tarnished because I'm kind of friends with a lot of the athletes who I had on a pedestal as gods, and now I see them um, just in their everyday life, and it's like. Back Mere then, humans. They're humans, yeah. They're humans. They mow their lawn, you know, and they have a beer. They're, they're human beings. But back then, these were gods to me. And so to, for me to be for, performing in front of them, this was like, wow. So we did, performed for them, did my stunt, got, uh, got presented with the check, flew off the next day to Reno, trained there for about eight months at altitude, ended up becoming a decathlete, came back, represented Great Britain in the decathlon, well, was just for people who don't know, you were you were originally a hurdler, right? You did hurdles originally before. Originally a hurdler, yeah. When I, as a kid, I was a hurdler, so, long jumper, sprinter. Yeah. You always to be a sprint hurdler, you've got to be a sprinter, and I was good at the long jump as well. It's just one of those things. If you're powerful, you're usually good at all all disciplines in terms of the short stuff, not the long stuff. I wasn't yes. good at anything after four hundred. Not my, my sport, but um, but yeah. So I went and decided to do the decathlon. He convinced me because he was a decathlete and uh, he knew how to coach it. And I came back and was third at the World Championship trials, but didn't, but missed out on going. And I remember distinctly while I was sat there in this freezing cold stadium in Hexham and there was no one around watching, um, which, you know, as performers at this point, I'd got used to people watching. I'd ran a club night in Reno, in Nevada, um, in this sort of basement of this oh, well let's let's drag this back again then what's this about a club night in reno like well what reno happened was here? amazing because when i got there i had all this this confidence of, of having done the shows and now i was really you know riding high on this and you found confidence of being a performer for the first time in my life um and so we me and enoch my friend went to the club there and we said look what's the chance of liam doing a few bit of work here and the guy knew the guy personally. So, well, yeah, we can sort that out, you know. Um, 
in a way which which is all right. And I ended up doing it. He was it was in this it was really cool. It was in this I think it was an ex brothel. And it was it was in the, the walls were all velvet. It was all pitch <clears throat> and real. But they but they'd managed man. It was five clubs in one, and we were down in this this the dingiest one basically. But we made it. We 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 tried our best to make it cool because it was it fitted perfectly with the seventies theme. And so we brought I brought all the stuff over from which we'd been doing in the clubs. Some of it worked. Some of it really bombed. Really 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 didn't work well at all. But we had to go, and we had some great amazing amazing memories. Some of the nights we had there. <laughs> were just incredible, you know. He was on the bar. I was a bit of DJ, a bit of MC, and a bit of uh, dancing, and it was just great. But the training was really hard, and it was a mile above sea level, which meant you know you really felt it in the lungs. And I was there in winter as well, so we had to train through that. I came back, and when I came back, the fitness. How many was... hours a day are you training now? We were training probably. This is getting on for more like four hours a day, and I'm only twenty. I'm not even twenty-one. Uh, which was annoying because he had to be 21 to drink. But it, um, but I was 20 at the time. And I got to see a lot of America. He had family in Arizona. We went down to Las Vegas. And it was great because when we went to Las Vegas, this Tommy Lloyd guy, I just called him and said, listen, the guy who was the director who spotted me. And they had contacts all over there. So they put us up for hotels, complimentary bar, um, what do you call it, restaurant tabs and all that stuff. So it was just amazing. It was just a real great encounter. And I knew Enoch yeah. from when he'd come over to Britain. He'd, he'd stayed at our house, you see. We'd put him up as one of the, there was a poster in Gates' stadium. Will you look after some American athletes? So my mom said, of course we will. And when he'd left politely and said, hey, if you ever want to come to America, hook me up. And of course I said, I'm, I'm coming, you know. And so it was a great friendship, which we have to this day. And uh, it, was, it was the first time for me that realized, okay, look, when I got back to England after it, and I suddenly realized, in this dingy, when I'm in this wet condition stadium with no one watching, doing 10 events rather than one. And on television... I assume be, th there's about there's about 12 people in the stands eating sandwiches or something like this. Literally, And they, 11 of them were my own family cheering me on. <laughs> so, and I remember <laughs> on the TV, and on the TV, it was, it was grandstand and it was athletics. And there was people I was beating the year before in hurdles, and they were now on the TV doing hurdles. And that got me. I said, listen, I'm going back to hurdles. I want to beat those guys. I've got to go back. So I went back to Loughborough, did my gap year, went to Loughborough. And uh, well, as soon as I got there, I decided I'm going to go for the hurdles. And I trained full time, flat out, did media studies and worked my way through there. And you're doing three foot six inch hurdles now, right? Because when three you were young, six. you were doing, um, yes, which is quite three, bloody high. It's a they are high. They are. Yeah. Yeah. They, they are high. And yeah. You lo we lose a lot of athletes because of the, the jump. But uh, but no, it was great. I, I loved the training. I loved uni. It was a campus uni. Um, all that was great. But the, the thing I realized was that I, I decided myself, I said, every year I'm going to go back to the streets for a few weeks and I'm going to try to make as much money as I can, try to meet as many sponsors as I can, try to make as many contacts as I can so that when I go back to Loughborough, I won't need my student. I won't need a student loan. I won't need to sponge off my parents. I'm going to do this myself. And I did it. And, you know, every year I'd go back. But because it was only for a few weeks, the the show itself evolved very, very slowly. Because it was only, you know, now if you're full time, they, things things evolve quickly. But at the time... You can develop something in an afternoon. Yeah, exactly. And, and I was still never considering myself a street performer. And I think part of that was was I didn't understand how amazing it was to be a street performer. I was still one of these people who said... You know, even then, I, I probably thought I was better than that. You know, I'm, I know I'm an athlete. I'm, I'm, I'm better than this. You know, this is just for that. And I realized it's just totally the wrong way of looking at it. You know, because this is, I love it. This is like, I love being a street performer. You know, it's just, it's. But let's, things... Well, we're gonna get to, we're gonna get to that now. But let's, yeah, let's but focus on you back, then. Back then, and I think yeah, I had to feel like that yeah. for me to, for me to think I'm gonna be a world beater in athletics. Um, I think if I just said no, I'm gonna be an athlete at that time, I would have felt like I'd. I'd I, you know what's the word? I don't know. I, I hadn't aimed high enough. I wanted to. I wanted to do that first, um, and I don't mean that in any disrespectful way. Because you had a set. You do, you am know, I right? If that comes across no, the wrong way, that's. But did you have a sense of vision? Sense of vision. But that's just me being. You you had a yeah, goal in mind. That's just me being honest a bit about how aloof I was at that time as well. You know, I had my. I was so tunnel vision on athletics that you. I, yeah. Even if you'd convinced me, hey Liam, by the way, if you do this for more, 
you can make more money and you can do both and you have a nice balance and this is what's feeding your soul. You're a performer, you're a natural performer, but I wouldn't have listened. I would have said, listen, I'm, I want to do this athletics thing and that's what I have to focus on. So I used to like, I used to get a, my brother Rob, who you know, was the first ever time that we designed a double act and we, we did it in 99 in the streets and had, if, Rob had never been a performer. He was, he'd done law in German at university and I asked him, I said, please help me out this summer. And we had this amazing summer and we basically made it into the, we had all the village people masks, but then we'd throw in a random one like the queen or, or the or Prince Charles or whatever. And the, the foreign tourists absolutely buzzed off it. So that's when the masks came and in so, really. Yeah. So, yeah. so you hadn't done the mask before this concept was real slow burner. Well, I'd done, I'd done one. I had the mask. I had ABBA, which was four masks, which looked just weird. I looked like a hammerhead shark. That didn't work. And I had one mask of John Travolta. <laughs> <laughs> that did yeah. work. So, so. And Michael Jackson was a latex one. When I went to America, we did, we started to make bigger ones. So I had all the village people and we had quite a few. So when I came back, we tried a lot of the stuff out in the nightclub. So we had a little bit of a platform to try stuff out. Um, we were getting paid anyway, so it didn't really matter whether it went down well or not. You know, we just tried stuff out. Uh, when I came back, we knew the masks did work. They got a giggle and they allowed me to never have to see the audience, which I was buzzing with. You know, I didn't I didn't want to make eye contact. I was more than happy to hide behind it and just rely on the rhythm and the music and try and do it that way. Yeah. And people, one guy yeah. came in up to me in Leicester Square because at this point, I still didn't realize that you, there was busking outside Leicester Square. So I just used to, every summer, 2000, I'd go to Leicester Square with my girlfriend at the time. 2001, I'd go to Leicester Square with my cousin. Or in 99, it was Rob. I didn't realize you could go elsewhere. And one guy came up, he says, listen, your show's good. It's funny, but you should make the masks much, much bigger. Like really blow them up. So I, I thought, okay, I, I will. So I, I blew them up and I've still got a lot of the masks in my lockup. The evolution, how they started this tiny and it got bigger and bigger and bigger, you know, throughout the years. And that's that, that was the summer where we sort of said, right, this works. And Rob then went and decided, I'm going to go to Australia, take the act, do it over there. And he ended up sacking off the whole law thing and becoming a world class street performer, you know, which uh, which was uh, I think I was yeah. definitely embryonic and helping him with that realization of, hey, this is a great world. You know, this is a very free liberal way and i think having like i was saying before i'm touching on the whole teacher thing and me not doing as well as not being able to learn as easy as i could as a kid this thing about being your own boss doing whatever you wanted when you wanted having your own creativity being in touch with your artistic side athletic side but also discipline side was just it was just me down to a t you know the whole chemistry of it all and was the comedy act, because when I watched Faces, uh, Faces of Disco, when you performed it in London, it was a very tight comedy routine. There was clearly thought going into what masks go with what songs and what body movements are relating to what masks and this kind of stuff. Was that there then? The kind of the the knowledge of, of what you're doing, so to speak. There was There wouldn't have been so many intricacies to it, but certainly the idea of the juxtaposition of, Let's start with the village people. So everyone thinks we're going to do the village people with the YMCA. But then let's throw in some people you would never expect dancing to these kind of songs in this kind of mannerisms. So let's throw the queen in, some royalties, some real people you'd never, ever see dancing. So that was the funny thing of someone who you'd never see them dancing. Now they're dancing. If you put someone out there like um, someone who's their expectancy dancing, it's not as funny. You know, you, it's got to be that juxtaposition. And that was always there that, that we, we grasped that early on. But then we started to, throughout the years as it developed, we just started to have a bit more fun with it. We realized it's a bit like a ventriloquist or a, a puppeteer where you can get away with a lot more when it's not really you doing it. It's the mask, you know. And so you can be a little bit more risque. You know, you could have uh, we used to have yeah. Tony Blair pole dancing and George Bush grinding behind him, you know, during these times. And people used to go mad for this to love it. But, you know, you can get away with stuff. Yeah. Are you still at uni now at this point? Are you still at uni or have at you left point, uni at no, this I'm, point? I was at uni until 2002. So throughout that time, every summer I'd go back with a different partner. But it would get longer. It wouldn't just be two weeks. I was starting to get a bit greedier now. And uh, it was, you know, I was seeing, seeing, listen, we can, we can really do all right with this. You know, let's, uh, let's do some more shows. 
Uh, but I like to work hard. I never used to. I think it was partly because um, from the onset, I hadn't decided I want to be a street performer. Now, nowadays, and this still stands for me now, if I had started and scratched the board and said, how do you design a show? It would be totally, totally different. I mean, for starters, the show was two-dimensional, which means you can only ever have a semicircle audience. No one could see the masks from the sides or the back. So you had to really, you only had a small angle. Um, there was no height involved. There was no audience participation. There was no stock lines. There was almost nothing other than me trying to squeeze in what, what can I do that, I, that doesn't require any new learning and how, how, how can I do it quickly? Because the season ended and literally the moment the athletic season would finish in August I'd go st- or September, I'd go straight out and try my best to do as many shows as possible. And I think having the endurance as well as an athlete and the stamina and just the mindset of I want to do as many as possible. I would do 15 shows, 15 shows, you know, again. And it was the physical demand and of it. it was, because when you have these masks, they're held on your face by biting onto a mouthpiece, which means. You so don't what have is the them. mask? Can, can you well, explain the mask a little bit to everyone? It's a, it's a two dimensional cardboard cutout with an image on front of the of the of, of, of someone, a celebrity. Let's say it's Simon Cowell. The eyes have to be looking forward so they always follow you wherever you are in the audience. Whoever you are in the audience, that mask is looking at you, you know. And then you, the, uh, the mask is held on my face with a mouthpiece, which I bite, which allows for quick change. Next one in, bang, bang, bang. And so when you're dancing and you're locking out these moves, you're not getting much oxygen inside. I've got a deviated septum, which yeah. means I can't breathe very well out my nose anyway. So I'm going... <laughs> And over time, they've now developed these respiratory devices for athletes, which do the same thing. They allow you to breathe and and work the mastoid muscles to to, to reduce the amount of airflow so you get stronger in your lungs and breathing. I was doing this 15 times a day, 15 minutes each show, again and again and again. We would do thousands of shows, you know. And because of the amount of shows we did, it allowed us to really get into the nice nuances of things that worked, didn't work, the subtleties, like you say, which is, is nice that you picked up on them because some people just see it as purely the slapstick. I mean, the kids see it as the comedy and then the adults see the other. Ladies. It's a bit, a bit like The Simpsons, really, in that, you know, it's an adult sitcom, but the kids can see it as a cartoon and adults can see it as the, the subtler jokes. And we tried to yeah. get a little bit of that in there. And uh, maybe we did at times and other times not so much, but we, we loved it. I absolutely loved it. Well, what I and find quite interesting contract. about this is it's um, it's a breath of fresh air when I saw it on pitch. And it makes sense because you've developed the show on your own through particular unique, so not unique maybe, but very particular different circumstances to most. Whenever I'd see the show, it's it was different from every other street show. It functioned differently. Yeah. Um, I've not seen any, even to this day, I've not seen anyone worldwide doing a show with it. And I definitely think there'd be people who could do it in terms of the dancing and things better than I've done or we've done it. But it just it was just something that evolved totally as a fluke, as the way of making money. And it was the right time. You've got to remember the time we're talking about here, 1998 to 2002 at this time where we're speaking about. There was no Britain's Got Talent. There was no X Factor. There was no pop stars. Opportunity Knox had been off the TV for several years. The whole country was starved of variety. So when we used to go to a street and we realized after this, by 99, I'd already realized that there were other places. So I started going to Guildford, Liverpool, all over the Newcastle. And people used to Are go Are you doing this all in the, the couple of weeks in the, the sort of post-season yep. time for athletics? Yep. So you're a, just cramming everything in in a few weeks, in like six yep. weeks or four weeks. Exactly. I had about four to six weeks before, war, before winter training begun. October the 1st, winter training would begin. Now, the downside for me was all my rivals were resting, resting their bodies, resting their limbs, their tendons. And I was pounding and pounding and pounding out the street shows. I don't know to this day whether that was a detrimental thing or a good thing. But I do know that in that six week period, I was always able to raise enough money for me to train as a full time athlete for almost the most of the next year. You know, it allowed me to have my rent. And not just the money I'd made in the hats, but the people I'd meet. I'd always have a sign. This is an important point for me because I used to have a sign saying, 
who I was, why I was doing it. And I felt it was important because I wanted to tell these people, just out of interest, I thought, I think they'll be interested to know that I'm using this money to go back to train as an Olympic level athlete and try and represent my country and do this. So I used to tell them. Was there a bit of the, I'm not, I'm not a real streety. Right. Is there, was there something of that? It's like, was, I'm not a street performer. Yeah. There was, there was that again. And it, that was a, again, me not understanding how amazing it is. Me being aloof and, and me just focusing. And also more than that, it was me realizing at times, Hey, this is, this is, this is the people are very kind, you know, especially you go to some of the working class places there, the Liverpools and Newcastles. Honestly, people were, were so amazingly kind that I was too scared to take the poster away because, you know, people were, it was amazing what people were given. And also it was a great way of meeting sponsors because you'd meet people who'd say, hey, I want to help you out. You know, I've not got a lot of money, but I want to help you out. So I would then spend the nights. This was literally, this is how it work, worked. I'd have, a, I'd have a Bedford Rascal camper van. And uh, by day, I'd be doing the shows. By night, I'd be laminating pictures envelopes sending off stuff to the contacts i've made during the day laminating photos because we used to do a little signed photo with details on the back of people who if anyone anyone gave a note i'd give them one of them to keep in touch there was no social media there was no internet no uh, there was no sorry facebook no youtube nothing like that so it was real old school stuff um but at times i felt like i did feel at times like it was a bit of a con because i'd go through stages you see where i'd feel I am going to make the Olympics. This is legit, you know, and I'd, I'd, you know, I'd feel really confident and then it would feel real. But if I'd just had a bad season, you know, my, looking back, I think, wow, Liam, you know, you're tough on yourself because the times I ran were some of the, sometimes the top 10 in the world and were great times. But at the time I was training with some people who were far better than me. So you're always very self-critical. So if I'd had well, about... you, you had the unfortunate blessing of training with the world record holders. Like, was it what's the bloody name of the guy? Is it Gardner? Had, well, he no, was the had, world had, record had, hurdler you, you, at the time, right? Had, had you and Thomas, four hundred meters. Uh, Chris Rawlinson, who was our British best at the time. Kamel Thompson, the Jamaican champion, who was number two in the world behind Felix Sanchez. And we had some this stable of athletes we had, and I used to have to keep up with them in training which a lot of the time I managed to do, not realizing I was level 10 out of 10 in effort level, they were only real level eight or nine because they'd save some of their energy for the season, which I didn't realize at the time, but I used to have to beat them in my mind. If I'm beating them, there's a chance I'm going to make the Olympics. So if I'd come off a season where, let's say, 2004, I was fourth at the Olympic trials, pulled my hamstring, didn't make, missed out on one place on going to Athens. I was so convinced I was going to go that all my family had bought tickets and they actually went. They drove over there, saw the games. <laughs> to this day, even just thinking so about Liam, it. Liam, we're going. We're going, we're going. But I went back to Buskin the next day after the trials with a gammy hamstring. And obviously you can imagine, I'm then having to tell, I'm then getting back on it and I've got my poster. And I'm then telling people, yeah, it's the World Championships next year and I'm going to make the British team. And I didn't feel like at the time I was going to do it. And so you feel like a bit of a fraud because you're telling these people, yes, that's what I'm doing this for. But in your mind, you're thinking, I don't really think I'm going to make this. But then as time goes on and the, the weeks would go on in Buskin, I'd start thinking, hey, hang on a minute. You've just got fourth at the Olympic trials. You missed out by one place. You're going to make the World Championships next year. You know, and then when the authenticity started to come out, that's when the, you know, the notes would start coming back in because people would, yeah. if, I, if I didn't believe it myself, your audience is not going to believe it. But I never ever. Is there a thing about the audience wanting to empathise with you? Definitely, there was a big, there was a massive charity aspect of what I did, and I knew that at the time, and you know, I I, I knew that was the situation, and I, I actually never knew or felt that the show was that good. You know, I never thought, I never considered myself a performer, a stripper, or even really an, a professional entertainer. It was always just something I'd done as a means to an end. To get to Olympics, did it feel a bit like a grift? Uh, yeah, sometimes it did because it, it, it was like you know you'd have to, even from one day to the next. If you're tired, some days you think I'm kidding myself here. I'm not going to make the Olympics, and then other days you'd be like, oh, "Fucking right, I am." And so from one day to the next, the 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 angle you were taking. Sometimes I felt like I, sometimes there was times where I just felt like I'd thrown the the poster away and just going, "I'm just going to do it as the show." 
But then, of course, you'd go, well, hang on, you're starting from scratch here because you've never done the whole speech of, hey, this is my job. This is what I do. You've always done the speech of, folks, this is not actually what I do. I'm actually British champion hurler trying to make yeah. the games. This is playing so, something else. Yeah, so I'm, I'm so just... sorry, but I've got my headphones on. I don't usually do this. I'm dying for a piss. Please carry on. I'm listening to you, mate. <laughs> okay. So um, it wasn't until... Um, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you a little interlude while you're doing it. I'll tell you about my eight near-death experiences in Guyana when I went to see my dad. That was mental. That was just before I went to Reno. And I went over there. This was total poverty. My dad was building sea defences because the land was below sea level. So he had to build the sea defences to make sure it didn't flood the lands. And while I was there, I was training on the beach. And this guy, this little farmer came down. And I had my spike bag hung on a palm tree. Comes down with his machete. Opens up one of the palm leaves. And there's inside is baby snakes. Full on baby snakes. And I'd been putting my bike back there, my spike bag there for days. So he hooks it out, chops the snakes up, and explains they're venomous, you know. So I, I, okay, I'll not be, I'll not be putting my stuff there. Another time, my dad says, Hey Liam, I'm gonna send you out with these rice workers. You wanna see the size of them? These guys hump 50, 100 kilogram bags of rice all day long. They're built like brick shit houses. You've got to see these guys. So I went on these rice paddy fields, and lo and behold, they're walking across these tiny planks and they get me to help them. So I'm thinking I know what's going on. 50 kilogram rice bags. I'm only 17 at the time. And below, there's crocodiles. The guys are laughing at me. There's crocodiles below. So I shit myself, you know, give the rice bags to them. Thinking if I fall in there, I'm absolutely gone, you know. A few, <coughs> day, a few, a bit. A few days later, my dad says, right, we're flying to Kaicho Falls on this little tin budgie. We're going to go over there. It's the second largest waterfall in the world, out in the middle of nowhere. He says, we're going to go there with some friends. We'll go there, fly over. I'm thinking if we crash it, you look down, it's just like the Amazon, it's just a carpet of green. If we go down here, we'll never be seen again. We get there, and in the bottom of the waterfall, there's these little Amerindian kids, and they're kicking around this frog, kicking them about, kicking it about. So I go in, pick the thing up, thinking it's dead, and it spits this white stuff all over my hand. So this little kid comes running over with a loincloth on, starts rubbing my hand with water inside, and he's starting to explain this is what they use for their darts. One of the most toxic, toxic um, neurotoxins you can have, and honestly, it was, it was, it was crazy. Another if night, you had a cut in your hand, I assume you'd be dead. Cut my hand, very, yeah, probably minutes to live. And then another night, me and my dad had a few. My dad had a few drinks. I had to drive him home along this road. No cars at the, uh, on these roads. It was just old uh, backwaters. And uh, we see all these. It was like the Walking Dead. All these people walking around. And I said, Dad, what's what's going on? So my dad says, Oh shit. He says the. Uh, the, the 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 mental home the institute for the mentally ill uh, burnt down these are all the the old inmates they're, they're walking around try and dodge them son don't hit them I'm thinking christ i could i couldn't even drive properly i didn't have my license at the time so you know i'm trying to clutch control and dodging these people like the walking dead and it was just mental so many different moments like that in these but for me as a youngster i'd lived abroad my whole life would lived in oman because of my dad's job we lived in mexico um, and then after that, when we went back to school and to do, you know, 11 plus and all that, whatever it is, you know, 11, 12 and go on to normal school, we had to settle down. He's, he kept bouncing around Libya and Guyana and the rest of it. But we always had these mad adventures as a kid. And I think part of that had come through to this this sort of this. I, I love the discipline life of athletics, but street performing gave me this adventure side again. You know, it was like, hey, hang on, this is this is you, man. This is this is what you love. You know, it's not all about weighing protein powders and, you know, microcycling your periodization of your but training. It's it's the about the life getting... of an athlete isn't one of yeah, excitement it's... and adventure, is it? It's, it's one not... of dedication and Absolutely. application. Yeah, there's no adventure in it. It's just pure and utter dedication, devotion and discipline. And uh, whereas and every year when I used to come out and do the street performance, it would give me that that four to six weeks of just pure arty uh, freedom. You know, we'd have a drink, we'd smoke a bit of weed sometimes. And it was just, it was just a great fun, you know, like it was just a let loose kind of, you know, this is, this is good. You know, this is a nice, this is a nice way. And it was something that for me personally, it was something where it was, it was in my soul. It fueled my soul, you know, but I still, still wasn't willing to consider myself an entertainer, a performer, in my mind, it was just a charity thing. 
to get there, you know. You, you grift into to service stuff, but there seems to be two elements yeah. in your story that's this rolling over. And one is dedication. If you're going to be this kind of athlete that you were, top level, top level, world class athlete, you've got to be dedicated and you've got to be uh, applied. But then this thing of adventure, this thing of like, I'll give it a go. Let's see what's going to happen. I want to live on the edge, which is really interesting. So you're now prepping up for the world championships. You're sort of thinking, am I going to get there this year? Yeah, I mean, after at, at that year, afterwards, again, every year I'd go back, every year I'd revamp the show. And this, this cycle went on and on. And I was always the near man. I was third at the Commonwealth Games trials. And I was the first Englishman past the post. The two in front were Welsh. I thought I deserved to go. I was a tenth of a second off lottery funding. I wrote to the English uh, Institute, the English Amateur Athletic Association, and said, look, I'll pay for myself to go to Melbourne to the Commonwealth Games. Come on. I said, I'm at, I'm, I'm at 50.2. This is, I'd moved up to the 400 meter hurdles at this point. And I was just on okay. knocking. And for people who say 50.2, what kind of level are you talking about? 50? I mean, well, I know, but for other people now, who don't know, now, what does 50.2 mean? Even now, that would get you in the top five of the Commonwealth Games, you know, even now. Um, yeah, it's 20 years on. It, it was I was 50.3. Under 50 usually gets you a medal at the Commonwealth Games. So I was saying, look, if I get there, you know, once with the atmosphere, and I'll, I think I can get a medal. I'm absolutely convinced I can. My coach was convinced as well. And they, they didn't, they wouldn't have it. They wouldn't have it. So that was, again, me going back to Buskin, tail between my legs, thinking, fucking hell, am I ever going to get there, you know? But it was actually, I was always that guy where, in, in, in hindsight now, I realize I actually did do well in that, uh, in that I, got, I think I got the best out of my body for what it was, you know, because of how hard I could train and how disciplined I was. But I just wasn't naturally fast enough, naturally good enough to make that grade. And I just wasn't willing also to do performance enhancing drugs, but have to, to make that great at that time, you know, to, in order to, to do what, what I dreamt about doing as a kid, you know, it's just, I'd come. Well, this is something we might come back to later yeah. because you've had a thing with performance enhancing drugs and not that you've taken them, but that you've actually, you've, um, you've shone a light on shone them, a light on them yeah. later on in your career. Yeah. Which we can come to in a little bit. So what happens now then? So you've not made the Commonwealth. How are you feeling? Where do you go from here? I was just getting used to dejection and then literally straight off onto the streets, get the kit, get the Bedford rascal, get back out there with whoever was my girlfriend or my best friend or my cousin, whoever I could rope in to do in Faces of Disco. Well, there was a question asked by uh, Philip Shea, a very, very good rope walker in Covent Garden. I know, and yeah. he asked, who was the we? So just can you just very briefly now he's a great guy um can you give us just a quick um joint through the people you worked with as double partners with your show up until this point yeah I, there was I, there was the first one was rob collins my brother then there was not be my girlfriend then there was davy my cousin my best mate um then there was um other friend iggy at university and then there was um what do i have next richard my the one who did Britain's Got Talent with in 2004, he was my, my one of my best mates and he, he did it with me. And then after Richard, by the time we got to about 2004. Well, I we can, started... we can go to there now. Let's, yeah, let's just get you up the... to the date where we are. Yeah. About, so we're yeah. up to the date now. You've gone back on the street. You're looking, you're trying to grab someone to work with. Yeah, always. And it was just a case of train them up, get them out there. They were never, ever ready, but we don't worry. We're going to do thousands of shows by day four. Well, they've done about 100, you'll have it, you know. It's, it was never that hard. And the nice thing with the masks, I always kept telling people, is listen, when you forget the moves, just go into character. If you forget what Del Boy should be doing, just be Del Boy. If you forget what Mr. Bean should be dancing with, just become Mr. Bean. And then you can't get it wrong because the audience watching, they don't know what you're supposed to be doing. And you're wearing a mask anyway, so you can't really get it wrong. And that was always a great way of giving them the confidence to experiment and get into that character and that really helped. Yeah. And so you found somebody, I assume, then, when you went out and searched after the common, after the, the kind of the loss of the Commonwealth. You found someone and you went back out on the street. And how did life um, evolve for you from that point then? Well, in, uh, in 2000 and, and uh, during this time, what I must add is from 2002, I'd realized that I was probably going to stay in Loughborough for a, a while. 
and I'd been sick of renting properties. So with some money saved and a bit of borrowing money, a bit of busking money, I bought my first property in Loughborough. This is when Mortgage Express were giving loans to anyone because it was basically, it wasn't about your own income. It was about how much rental income do you have from the students? And because I had that many students and athletes wanting good quality houses, it was an easy supply chain to fulfill. So I bought a house, lived there, rented the other rooms out. And by the time it was done, about six months later, I realized from a mortgage advisor, I said, well, you know, you've got a lot of equity in there. I didn't know what this meant at the time, but said, if you remortgage it, then you can take a big chunk out and do it again. I said, okay, well, that, that sounds good. So, and there was such a margin. It was sort of, you know, it was a really good income because you're renting the rooms per room. So it was a really good yield. Mm. And it was a great way of gathering more property. So I started to get a bit obsessed. And this was also at the same time as I was starting to see athletes in their 30s who start, I started to think, I don't want to be one of these guys in their 30s who's dedicated their whole life. They've got no experience in any business. They've got no experience in any job. They don't know anything outside of an athletics track. And if I don't get the medals I'm like, I want to get, I want to have something else to fall back on, you know, and properties. I to assume be these guys aren't in a good thing. place then. The, these these 30 year old performers, uh, performers, these 30 year old athletes, they're not, they're not able to, to, to work. It's like being a street performer and then someone well, liking in this time now quarantine. So you can't street perform. You're kind of buggered. You don't integrate into life with that, uh, that life experience, I assume. It's tough. It's tough because a lot of people, it's a bit, for some people, it's a bit like if you imagine coming back from being in the military where you've had a purpose, you've had goals, you've had structure, and all of a sudden you've got none of it and you've got to make your own. Not everyone was good. I was good at being self-disciplined. Not everyone, once they go away from that coach and lifestyle, knows just what the hell to do at 35 years old when some of your people you grew up with are 15 years deep in experience, you know, and climbing the corporate ladder. And it didn't work out for you. Yeah. For the ones who did, who got the Olympic rings tattooed on the shoulder and made the games, that's for life. You're an Olympian. It doesn't matter whether you, you know, give me poverty if I could put those rings on my shoulder. All day long, I'd take it because that's just yeah. the pinnacle of any athlete's dream. But, but for those who didn't make it, I was starting to get a little bit scared of, oh, shit, you know, like, like this might not turn out the way the fairy tale ending you know this might not i might not be good enough and i think that was what catapulted me into wanting to get more houses so that became a bit of a, yeah. a juggle you know it was the juggle between and this it got to the point where in 2004 when i got fourth at the olympic trials and missed out by one place i was in ikea the day before lumping flat pack furniture because tenants were moving into houses and i look back and think what a fucking idiot, you know? It's like, what? where was your brain? What were you... But at that point, it was like living two lives. It was, I was the landlord. I was renovating my own houses. I was trying to keep the cost down, doing it all myself. I had a girlfriend at the time and trying to manage that. Um, and then on top of that, I was, I, was being, I was managing all the tenants as well, all the students, trying to run a, as a lettings agency. And I had eight houses, six or six or eight houses. It was climbing up. I was getting more and more. The way I saw... I was this... And was this just turning over the, the, the value of the properties, yeah. getting one more? The property market. I mean, I know the crazy Yeah. I know the crazy tough. thing at that time. I was a student at that time with zero income, zero savings. And I got offered a hundred percent mortgage. Yeah. Crazy time. Yeah, they they were lending money left, right, and center. I'd never been in business before. I never learned studied business. I didn't know anything about business. But it were very easy sums. There were GCSE level or, or prior sums in terms of working out you know, rental income, equity, all this stuff. So it was pretty easy. And it just seemed like if it, it was an opportunity. It was an amazing opportunity to, I, I thought, why are more people not doing it? You know what, I'm buying these houses, ten tenants are moving in, I'm getting an income, I'm getting equity for the future. Why is more people? So I went out and literally bought 10 empty folders and I put them on, the, on my shelf. And I thought, when I've got 10 houses, I can retire off that. I can live off that. I won't need a job. I can do that. And gradually, those files and those file dividers became full with each one became a different house. And it became like anything with me at that time. And see, even to this day, it's like it becomes an obsession. It becomes tunnel vision. And it's it, people could have advised me and told me differently. I wouldn't have listened. You know, it was just it was just my way or, or you know, no other way. It was, it was difficult in that way. Yeah. And were you, you know, still performing so, at this time? Did performing take a back yep. seat? 
Well, in 2005, um, what happened is I, I, I was so in 2006, sorry, um, jumping to there. I hadn't qualified for major games. I'd been the nearly man every time. Um, at this point, I had. Early man is like just, just, just off, right? Just, You're just, just off from the qualifying. Grade. Just missing the grade. Proud yeah. of what I achieved, but just missing the grade forever. Actually making the games and getting there, and actually making a career out of athletics. You know, not making a living out okay. of it, and and having yeah. to fund it all yourself and all the grind of it. And at this point, I threw the towel and I said, I'd done a race in Europe, and I came back dejected and thought, I'm done. With I had Achilles problems. I thought, I'm done with this life. The the property had become so consuming. And so intensive, and the the love and the passion for athletics, and probably the belief that I was going to do it. Um, in hindsight, I kind of wish I'd, I'd I'd been able to get over the injuries with the knowledge I know now. But at the time, you do the best you can, and my best at the time wasn't good enough to get over those. And so, I left it, and I went. I uh, bought a. I left, uh, it was weird. A weird time for me. I call it a bit of a mini midlife crisis because I'd been the athlete for so many years. Once you end that. You have no self-identity. You know, I wasn't Liam the property developer. I was just Liam the athlete. And so all of a sudden... Or Liam the street performer. Like, Liam the street street performer was Liam the guy doing this to be an athlete. Correct. It was all under the umbrella of... I was just Liam the athlete. And it all fitted under that. And suddenly I did not... I really didn't know who the fuck I was. It was just like, who am I? What am I doing? All my friends had left from Loughborough. They'd all gone on to other things. I had a... I'd split up with my girlfriend. I was I was just too stressed with the properties. I wasn't doing it in athletics, and I suddenly decided I'm gonna I'm gonna buy a camper van, and I'm gonna I'm gonna leave. So I did. I bought a camper van, left, went to London, um, and I went to Abbey Wood campsite, parked up there in winter on my own, and I was just sitting there. You know, my my cousin was dealing with the properties. He very kindly knew I was in a bad place. He helped me out took on the properties and on the letting side of things and the management side. And then um, I said, he, he contacted me, he said, look, you know, we can do this in a bigger way because the properties in, in Manchester where he was were cheaper. The, but he had friends who could do the labor, but the te- the rents was higher. And he said, you know, why don't we do some there? So we, we carried on, we built the portfolio. I did a bit of busking and helped out with that. And, then I got, I teamed up with this, an old friend of mine, a guy called Iggy from Crawley. And he was a friend from Loughborough. He was an athlete himself. And we were really good friends at the time. And when I got back with him, the infectious nature he had and the, the attitude towards athletics made me realize I'm, I'm not done with this yet. You know, I still had some, some uh, demons. And so he said, look, my dad, his dad he's an Indian lad. And he's, his, his dad has suggested something. He said, why don't we go to altitude, to the Himalayas, to this place called Chimla? Granted, there's more monkeys, baboons than people, so we've got to be careful. But it's high at altitude. It's really cool. It's where the Indians go for their, their holiday. They used to go during the, uh, the British Empire sort of period up to Shimla because it's much cooler. And I said, OK. And he said, well, let's go up there. We'll train. We'll get your hemoglobin, your blood level up to the level it needs to be. We'll bring you back down to sea level. And we'll smash it for the Olympic trials for 2004, for, uh, sorry, 2008 for Beijing. So this is what we did. We went over there. Uh, but prior to going over, I thought I'd entered Britain's Got Talent with Richard Edmonds, the lad who I eventually did it with. We flew back from India to take part in Britain's Got Talent. We'd entered the wrong program. We entered Brian Connolly's Let Me Entertain You from BBC. Ended up getting <laughs> beaten. Ended up getting set, beaten by this little kid in a sequin jacket, singing "I Am What I Am," and distraught, flew back to back to India. <laughs> Not a no money at all. Um, no just just before money. we go on to go back to India, what was the experience like when you went there and you went into the TV show? It's it's your first TV experience, right? Yeah, I mean bits and pieces on news parts, but this at this point at this point. Um, there's a company now called Fullwell 73. I'll briefly segue to this. And a guy called Leo Perlman was my best friend at school. He was a bit of a genius at school. He was brilliant at English. I hooked up with him in London at this same time. I hadn't seen him in years. And I said, what are you up to? He said, I'm a, I'm a film producer now. And he says, um, we're currently filming this film called In the Hands of the Gods. It's about a load of freestyle street performers who do football skills. And they're busking their way to Maradona. And he said, what are you doing? I said, weird, you should say that. 
I'm flying to India and I'm trying to busk my way to the Olympics. I'm a street performer. I'm an athlete. I'm trying to get to 2008. And he went, let's see if we can pitch this to the BBC and we'll send a film crew to the Himalayas to film you. So that's what they did. Now, they were a pretty much unknown entity at the time. They weren't a big film production company. They are now the company who did the Usain Bolt film, the One Direction film. They do The Late Show with Jake, uh, James Corden and Carpool Karaoke wow. is, is all theirs. That's, they, they did all that. So they've, they've gone massive now. So it's they're, they're now an established, yeah, established uh, company. Yeah, they're massive now. But at the time, this was one of their first kind of little pilot things back then. So it was really nice to be working with a company like that. So they flew over there. But the problem we had is everything was going great. Everything was going absolutely fine. Then one day, the monkeys saw one of their red little tapes, thought it was food, came down, grabbed the tapes. I legged it after them. All of a sudden, got surrounded by these monkeys, these evil little things, things with the backsides hanging out and the, the teeth, like, like baboons in a way. I didn't know what to do. I froze. So I'm thinking, right, yeah. I can either stand still or leg it. I don't know what to do here. So the last minute, I just chose to leg it, twisted my ankle, which was a nightmare. As we, it, you know, at that point, it was like, what do we do? We can't hurdle. We can't sprint. So we started doing a lot of hopping. This is on, on YouTube. If you type in the, the final hurdle, full well 73, there's a, there's a full 40-minute documentary on what they did. And they did a brilliant job. Even as beginners, they did a really brilliant job. And you can see this step thing I do where I do these bunny hop steps of about 100 steps. But because we were at 8,000 feet, what that did to the immune system was massive. So we, this was a few days before we left. And part of me... Because you starved showing, of oxygen, right? Starved you, of oxygen. You're really struggling to... Yeah. Yep. Part of me probably showing off because the cameras are there. And I re, deplete me my immune system. And on, on the way back home, I grab a roadside burger. Get home. Straight into incubation. Six inch syringe in my thigh, three or four uh, liters of blood or whatever it is, um, quarts of blood put back in. They think I've got typhoid in incubation. Turns out it was something, traveler's diarrhea, but just really, really bad acute stuff. But I lost. Could you... they, they came in at the end. There's a scene at the end where they're like, well, the, the bad news is you're not, you know, you've lost a lot of weight and you're probably not going to be in shape for the Olympic trials. The, you know, the good news is you've got the, the hemoglobin of a mountain goat. Um, so I, I did the trials. I did, I did a race. I did one race that year, 2006. Absolutely. I was so skinny by the time I had this flu and virus that I am. Um, it was a nightmare, you know. So at that point, that was the last race. I said, listen, to hell with this. You know, I'm done. I'm done with this. I'm going full on into the property side. You know, I'm done with athletics. I'm not an entertainer. Um, I've just been doing it for the charity thing. And that's when Britain's Got Talent got in touch not long a few years after they, they they were the ones who said we want you to come on the show and i said to richard should we do it you know this is we're fast and, forward a bit and why here. did they want you to come on the show they'd seen us how simon did they cowell, know that you were a thing simon cowell's pa had seen us in kingston upon thames and she'd relayed to him and she said, you must enter Simon's show. And that's when we'd entered the wrong show in two, the previous time. So the next time when we entered, when they, they got in touch and we said, you know, they, they tried to find us from Gates at Harriers and tried to find Richard. And Richard called me and said, have they tried to contact you? I said, yeah. And we said, we've got to get the right show this time. And I didn't know whether to do it because by the time this came on, this was 2009. By this point, me and Iggy have parted ways. We've fallen out in bad terms. The recessions hit in 2008. Our our property company has got, we've got 45 members of staff. We've got overheads through the roof. We've grown into Midlands, Manchester, Loughborough, Newcastle. And it's, it's, it's a big enterprise now. And we had a fund. We had a fund starting. Um, and we were very ambitious. This is me and my cousin, Davy, you know, real ambitious. And we really wanted to do this. And I think the, the thing was, was that, these companies in property were born out of the failure of athletics. And one of the problems was, was that looking back and having had the hindsight and years to look at where the hell did we go wrong? When you've, when you've been, when you've competed at that level or you've had the thrill of athletics or the thrill of the adrenaline, it's hard to go into anything and do it as a steady eddy to do it on a normal steady the way it should be done the way a businessman should do it the way a normal company should be run 
we wanted to fly before we could even walk. You know, it was literally... Well, we... I think we'll come to this, if it's okay, me say this, we'll come to this more later, because I yeah. think this becomes more of a a real footnote in your life later on. Um, even though I know that it's developing this point, the fact that you've got 45 members of staff, it's a huge working it was that, it was crazy, organism yeah. right now. Yeah, it was, it was um, real But at easy. this point, at this point, you're running this industry, but you've also got kind of picked up um, by Britain's Got Talent. And by the sounds of it, you don't see yourself as a performer at this moment. You see yourself this as a property the, developer, but... yeah. Am I correct in thinking thing. you thought, give it a go? Like, we've got this show. This show kind of works. We've got this offer. Why not? Adventure. Exactly. And I, I did even speak to um, our lawyer at the time and say, what do you think? Does this not going to make me look like I've not got my eye on the ball? We're just about to launch a fund. We're trying to do this in business. We've got a lot of investors. He said, to be honest, it'll show that you're normal. It'll show that you've got another side to you, that you're interesting. And that it's not all about property. He says, and he even said, go for it. So I spoke to Richard yeah. and we both said, look, for once we will find out if this show has any merit whatsoever. Because so far, we've really both thought it was a bit of a charity thing to raise money for you. It was never, ladies and gentlemen, Richard, the performer. It was, this is my mate Richard from Loughborough who's helping me out. You know, this is my mate Iggy who's helping me out. These, yeah. they're, not, they're not professional. I've dragged them into this. This could have it's been a grift. You, folks. Yeah, it was like, you know, these were people who yeah. helped, genuinely helping me. But I got lucky with Richard because he'd done drama at, at, at uh, Loughborough and he was just a great performer, you know. So I got lucky with him. And we both said, look, let's go. Simon Cowell won't beat around the bush. If he thinks it's crap, he'll tell us. And if he thinks it's good, he'll tell us too. So let's see what the judges say. So what was your experience like when you, when you, when you began the, the Britain's Got Talent journey? Well, we were, we were lucky, first of all. We didn't have to do the first stage where you send the video in because they'd already seen us. So we went through to the stage where you have to go in front of, it's not live and it's not in front of an audience. It's in front of the producer, director, their runners, whatever. So you're just in front of the camera. And we did that. We did our little skit, you know, our one minute 20 or whatever they give you. And, you know, they say, we'll let you know. And so they, they got back and said, well, yeah, we, we like what you've done. You're now through to... The live stages where you will now be in front of the four judges of Amanda Holden, Piers Morgan, Simon Cowell and Kelly Brook. So that was the stage that was in Salford in Manchester. And I remember the night before, typical of me, the night before, Jigsaw in the basement of one of my tenants' house, cutting out the faces that we're going to about to use on the next round. It was never planned. It was never um, in that stage. That was the the artsy fartsy, not quite marrying up with the discipline yet, and just not actually believing. Hey, listen, this get your shit together. You're a performer, get it right, you know. But we nailed it. We got it right. We got it. We got four yeses. Um, some of the really great comments, they they actually cut off. You know, Amanda Holden said this is genius. Simon Cowell said this could possibly win. And then when they condensed it down, it took a lot out, and it made me realize when you see the live version, they must, they really must have an idea. From the onset, as I would, if I was producing it, I wouldn't want to take any chances. I'd want to know, OK, these are roughly the acts we want to have in the final. They're the ones we want. So I think the producers, there's a lot of manipulation. And I'll go into how that works. You get to see quite a lot of just really what goes on. And it is an eye opener, especially for some of the younger contestants who are used to being in competitions. One little dancer I had to say to her, she was distraught. She'd been knocked out of the semifinals or the live stages. And there's a guy, Fred from Loughborough, who was set in his 70s, who'd done some really mediocre breakdancing, bless him. And she couldn't understand why he'd gone through. And I said, look, it's really not a fair competition. This is not a competition of talent per se. It's, it's who makes the best television. And there's, there's sort of, there's, there's three categories. There's those who are not very good, but make TV. There's those who are good and could win it. And then there's the rest who actually can make full-on careers as great entertainers, but they're not funny enough to make great TV and they're not quite good enough to win Britain's Got Talent. So they're the ones who end up getting knocked out. And it's a, it's a shame because it's, it's not fair in that respect. But as long as you know that going into it, you won't be too disheartened. You know, you must know. Look, Go in there with a, an element of cynicism. Yeah, it is about making great TV and they might, you might not fit their criteria at that time. And we went in there, eyes open, got past the first round. 
got past the, the judges stage. And then they said, OK, you're through to the second round, the next round, which is just literally you will be standing in a lineup in front of Simon Cowell. And he will tell you, look, you've come this way. You've been great. But sorry, you're going home or well done. You're going through. So we stood up there and I whispered to Richard. I said, there's no chance we've got through here. I said, look to the left and the right. To the right, there was two. They'll, they won't be mind me saying this, but two overweight lads, right, um, who were doing some sort of Irish dance. And I thought, they can't be professionals. I'm sure they haven't gone through. And then there was this woman to my left. She just... She just she was in she looked just like this old woman and didn't have it quite together and I thought we're all going out here. We looked like the lineup of you didn't make it. But then we got through. And that's when I realized this woman to my left was Susan Boyle and the guys to my right were oh. Flatterly. <laughs> Stan Ross ended up getting third. Susan Boyle ended up getting second and diversity ended up winning it. And so Susan Boyle was so ecstatic. She was calling her mom, calling her home. She had to stay another night because she she'd got through and this, that, and the other. And I, I, I ended up calling my auntie Pat. I said, Andy Pat, you've got to speak to Susan here. She wants to speak to you and all this stuff. And she was a lovely woman. It was just all a bit too much for her, you know. But she was just a genuinely nice woman who was just had lived in, out in the wild with her cats and just didn't really want fame and fortune, just wanted to have a go to have some fun, you know. And she was a great singer. And had a beautiful voice, yeah. Amazing, amazing. But we then got through to what they call the live finals, which is where it's only two acts from each semi-final, the live finals, go through to the grand final. And this was um, where we, we were in the live finals. And this is the point where you really want to get a good semi-final. You know, it's like athletics. You want to make sure you're in a good semi-final. And we looked at the lineup and they said, you're in with Susan Boyle and diversity. We're like, oh, Christ, you know, we're not making the live <laughs> final. Then, you know, we're not making the live final. Then. So we went in there and Richard, you know, hats off to Richard. He'd been suffering from a lot of anxiety at that point. He, just, he was just going through a lot. He was, he was suffering panic attacks. And uh, we couldn't do any rehearsals because of it because his heart rate was going through the roof. So we literally had a small window where we tried to get, get the act together for the semifinal. And uh, we, we did a good job. We, we got another, um, what was it again? At this point, Simon buzzed because Richard pulled the skirt up for the Queen, just joking about, but of course Simon's trying to get his knighthood. So Simon can't be seen to be liking the, the, the Queen pulling the skirt up. So, uh, but then after that, we had a full chorus line of Simon Cowell faces to take the piss out of him. And of course, because we didn't have any Piers Morgan ones, Piers had to buzz that one. So we ended up getting two ticks, two buzzes. Um, and at the time afterwards, we didn't make the final and we were, we were gutted, you know, because we, the end, it was the end of the journey of such of something which you're on a high. But we, you know, we, we went our separate ways. And were they, were they as an organization, were they buffing you all the way through this? Were all they, the were way they, through. yeah, they're telling you all the way through that you, you can, they're telling everyone you, you're going to win it, you can do this. You know, they're really bigging you up um, and, and, and in some ways setting a lot of people up. But we, were, we, we didn't think we were going to win it, but we just, it was the end of the road, so you disappointed, went back home. But the amazing thing was, when we got in, because of the, the media hysteria around Susan Boyle, the fact that she'd been flown over to Oprah Winfrey and she'd been all around America, you know, in terms of the news broadcast, the whole world had tuned in to see Susan Boyle. And we were the act directly before, so it was the most amazing platform even if you don't win, it was like the best platform was the viewing figures records of 18 million watching. And Couldn't get better exposure. Couldn't get better exposure. And luckily, Forward Thinking, Richard and I had set up the Face of the Disco website to take bookings. And even though you are, you, you do have to sign up to Simon Cowell's psycho uh, agency. I'm not calling it psycho. That's actually the name of it. S-Y-C-O. You have to sign to his management and agency. Do, do you mind talking about what that entails? I don't know if you're able to. Well, um, yeah, I mean, they were, they, they were really good with us because to start with, you have to pay the agent 10% and they get you the gigs and they, they really do earn their crust. But the management company, we felt a bit robbed because all the bookings were coming through our website. We then had to pass them on to the management company and we were doing all the negotiating and talking. So they were taking 20% of it. And it was a lot of money at the time. It was sort of £1,500 a gig, you know, which was ridiculous for us because this was... And how long does this last for? Does, is this until till time in memoriam or one year or two years? Well, this is the thing. I mean, I don't know. For other, oh, the contract is supposed to be, I think, for three years. Now, the, we didn't have a problem with the agency contract because they were working for the money. 
But we, we approached the management company, or Richard did, not long afterwards to say, look, we're doing all the work. And to be honest, they said, yeah, listen, we're, we're busy dealing with diversity and Susan Boyle, you crack on, lads. We're not, we're not going to, you know, we don't need the 20%. So they were good with that. So at that point, we didn't need to get lawyers or anything involved. We just cracked on and we had an amazing time. Because all of a sudden, we knew, hey, guess what? It was never always all about the charity thing. It was actually in its own right. Um, had some, had a lot of merit as a as a show, and when we got and this is when I realised yeah. it, when we got back to my house, and I was you know I was a bit disappointed and the rest of it, dejected. Um, I looked in my emails. We must have had three hundred, two or three hundred emails of booking requests, and people were going, "Can you do the masks of my wedding? Can you do my mask?" And we suddenly went, "Hey, this is what we're about. We're the guys who do." The dances that we did on Britain's Got Talent, but the finale is we get the masks made of your people. So we come out as the bride and the groom and we come out and that's when we realized, ah, OK, I get it. Now, this is this is what we're about. This is our set, our unique selling point. This is like a, a, a personal pro, a personal product. Yeah, you can have everything there. Yeah. But then the end is a little personal that's touch. Right. It's about you. Yeah. It's not about us. It's about you. Yeah. And, and if you the more you tell us about the and... characters, the more we can put in in terms of the, the dance moves. What do they play? Is there any little bromances between the best men, the, 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 the you know, the, the bridesmaids? And so we just we did for so long uh, i mean i had the property stuff going on so we couldn't take our eye off that richard had his own businesses going mm. on but almost every weekend yeah. we were out gigging one or two gigs around the country and sometimes across to um europe and uh, where we had a bad experience in europe we went to this all expenses really? paid five-star accommodation in rome and it was a really classy do really expensive do and they they'd given us the images in advance and of course, we'd had them professionally made as we do. And then as we did with every gig, we would invite the, the, the client in and we'd say, look, here's the masks. Can you tell them which ones we need to pair up with who? They'd say, yes, him with her, him with him, et cetera. So they told us, but this was slightly weird because we had, there was kids here, there was kids involved. They wanted us to do their pets. They wanted us to do their kids, three, four-year-olds, five-year-olds. Okay, no problem. We'll just take out the sexual innuendos and all that stuff and the hip thrusting and tone it down. So we did started the first dance, and this was the same time as Russell Brand and Jonathan Ross had had that bit of tussle, 2010-11 time, or 2010 time. And so we had Jonathan Ross and Russell Brand's face, and we'd come out and do all the rest of it. And of course, Russell Brand being the total sex lothario that he is, um, we'd have certain moves for him, and Jonathan Ross would just be Jonathan Ross. We came out, and I came out as Russell Brand, thinking I'm with Jonathan Ross. I didn't realize that... Richard had been had had his masks turned one way. I'd had my mask turned the other way by mistake. So I had the three. So it's ruined the order. So it's ruined the order. So I've got the I've he's got he's got the four year old kid on, and I'm Russell Brand doing all these sexual innuendos and gestures, and of course we suddenly realised that Richard, being, <laughs> luckily Richard being as really quick, realised what has happened. This is split second time and turns the mask around, gets them in order, and we nail the second mask because it's one of those shows where. Each change is 15 <clears throat> seconds. So by the time the audience is laughing and realizing they shouldn't be laughing, you're on to the next one. And we actually got away with it because afterwards they, they were coming up still saying, oh, it's fantastic. I loved seeing my grandson dancing there with Russell Brand. Marvelous. And we're like, sure, I think we might have got away with that, you know, yeah. just. But yeah, the only, only time. I remember talking to you about this when we were sat on pitch together and you said there was a lot of glitz and glamour during this time. You said you get into clubs and this kind of thing. What was the, you, did you have a, a life of a celebrity for some time um, from this? Uh, yeah. As far as I've uh, witnessed before in terms of celebrity, because obviously athletics is such a niche, you know, you, um, you may sign a few autographs yeah. on the race day, but beyond that, no one's recognizing you in the street or anything. But this was the first time. Yeah, it's not being where... a street performer. Yeah, exactly. Everyone knows it in that moment, yeah. but after it, it's gone. So this was the first time ever for me where people were were recognizing you. You know, you were you were getting on get through the agency. You were getting on guest lists for all the different sort of things and clubs, and it was it was great fun. You know, it definitely made the most out of it at the time, knowing it was going to be short lived. You know, you're only next year. It's another yeah. crop of of talent uh, wannabes and the rest of it. So yeah, we definitely made and, the most of it. And it was, a and so it was. Fun. And so it was short-lived. So, so I assume that this thing drifted off quite quickly. Then, 
it's actually, it's a fickle fickle thing. Actually, no, it went it 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 went the other way, in that we suddenly realised that we were turning down bookings because we didn't have, you know, we were we were booked out. And then it was one time where this client said, "Well, don't you have anyone who can do the act?" And I went, "Well, hang on, what do you mean do the act? We were the ones who did it." And they went, "Yeah, but don't you have anyone who could do the act?" And I went, "Hang on, we need to we need to train some other people up because." We can have more than one act going out. It doesn't need to be us. You know, me, I thought it has to be us. We were the ones doing it. It didn't. So we split into two groups. Richard would do the London gigs with another guy and I'd do the Northern gigs with another guy. And that's when we, that was the first part of splitting up from Richard. And we realized, you know, we can, we can, there's a lot of mileage to this. And it didn't really slow down for the first couple of years. And then once we started doing others, um, we could we could do more bookings you know the fee came down the fee had to come down because you were no longer last year's talent show um, whatever's you know you were you were now just but we were now just an established act so did you essentially franchise is, is that the kind of yeah, thing that we happened tried. we essentially that's that's kind of what it was like but we weren't um that's how it went then, then we made the mistake of thinking that's what we could do in terms of busking we thought you know what we can we can train people up to go out and busk and you know how are we going to monitor it well we can have a video camera which we can dial in and monitor making sure that we can have rip cords and we can pick them up and someone can pick the cash it was like and it just was never going to work you know it's just another bad idea we thought we we, we thought we could do why was it never going to work because the whole thing with street performing relies on trust you know you've got to absolutely trust and i had only ever worked with family members girlfriends brothers i'd never taken trained strangers up to take something I'd invented to try and run with it and actually trust them to pay my cut into the bank and not just keep it, you know? And, and was, was there an element of them undermining the product as well? Because you there developed was, something. Yeah, there was. And this is something which uh, I know Richard feels strongly as well as we did start to undermine the, the, the product and the brand equity of what we're doing and diluting it. And it was just a, it was just a mistake. It was just a bad idea. With I wanted to do it because... I thought, you know what, if this can be done, why not try and see if it can be done? You know, we'll soon know. But unfortunately, I found out the hard way that you just can't trust other people. Once the temptation's there with a the bag of money, they're not always going to pay you your cut, you know. And I was probably too, yeah. too at the time, I was too, again, I, I don't know if greedy is the right word, but if I'd, be, if I'd given them a much bigger share and taken a much smaller one, maybe there wouldn't have been the corruption in the process. You know, maybe they would have gone, wow, I'm doing yeah. well, but... You know, but is this thing of like to draw it to a for, uh, an athletic analogy? You were trying to get your personal best at all points. You wanted your PB. At everything I've ever done, it's never been about the money. It's never been about fame. For me, whenever I do anything, I go, "What's the ultimate that this can do?" You know, what's the end result as a busker? What's the most you can make, or what's the biggest crowd? Or what's the end result you can do with what you've got? You know, with me. Without starting yeah. the scratch and learning and getting the height and getting a new show, whatever, with the with the skills that I've got, without learning new ones, I've got a bit of dancing, a bit of comedy, a bit of athleticism. Yeah. What can I do? And how is it a case of doing more shows, or is it a case of making the show better? Do I want to work festivals? Do I want... I've always wanted to, to do the absolute best that I can do in everything. That yeah. is the feel good factor. You, you strived. Know? Yeah. To do so when I met you in London. So when I met you in London and you were coming and doing the Faces of Disco in London, um, and I'll be honest, when I saw the show, as I said, I'll say this again, I thought it was one of the original shows I saw. It didn't have the structure of every other street show. I found it a genuinely enjoyable and exciting and interesting thing to watch. Thank you. Because of those reasons. You're welcome. Um, at what stage we're there? Is, have you left behind the idea of franchising when you come to the point where I've met you in London at around... I can't even think of the year it'd be at this point, you know. You just you just see me, you just you just see when I started to do more street stuff, that was once we'd seen the initial wave of the all the good stuff from Britain's Got Talent and we're still doing gigs. I mean, even to this day we get the odd gig ten years on. But at that stage, I was going back into doing some more of the street stuff. I'd missed it. I'd loved the street stuff. And the weird thing about doing the street stuff was when people saw us as faces of disco in the white suits doing that. If you've been on TV, people think you're rich. They think you've already made it, right? You've been on TV. You did really well. You were in with Susan Boyle and Diversity. We did well enough to the point where people thought, why are you on the streets? What are you doing here? You know, and it was like, hang on. 
no, we're street performers now. This is what we always were. This is what we were. And this, at this point, I was, I was now at the point where I was like, I love street performing, you know. I'd started to grab, get the bug again. Because be, being behind a mask the whole time is one thing. But then when you've got lights as well and you're on a stage, that you could never see the audience. Never see them even normally with a mask on. But at least in the street, there's a little bit of interaction with me where you're talking to them. You've got the money speech. You've got the interaction at the beginning. Still no audience participation ever and still no height, but at least you get to see your audience. And I liked that, you know, and being, I was living in Covent Garden at the time. I was doing the properties from there. Um, and I thought, you know, I've got to start working in Covent Garden. This is the magical place which I've never worked. And that would have been quite a bit later. That was 2012. That was when I got Andre. Wow. I, yeah, that was 2012. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. By that point, we'd had three years, uh, Three of this was 2009 to 2012. We'd had those years of Britain's Got Talent. We'd had success in property in some areas i had at this point i had 30 properties with davy we had a lot more under management we, and uh, we were now starting so this to is a multi-million big. pound for portfolio yeah it was it was we were starting to aim really big in that but i loved i loved there was a part of it which was the because i was stuck all day long making calls making calls all day long non-stop from morning till night making calls on the sales all the operations was up north but all the financial stuff was down here in London and uh, our lawyers were down in London. A lot of the investors were down in London. So my job... I mean, I was so surprised because you just seemed like a guy on the pitch having fun, enjoying doing street shows. That's genuine what it seemed like from my perspective of meeting you at the time. I, I appreciate that. I was probably camouflaged with a lot of the stress from the property stuff still. because You didn't it carry it through. I think it, when, you can, when you see me perform like, like a lot of performers, if you're doing it because you want to be there, not because you've, I need this 100 quid or I need this 50 quid. If you're doing it because yeah. you love it, it is a totally different feeling. And the guy, Andre, who I was working with then, I have to say he was probably one of the best in terms of natural ability as a performer, in terms of dancing. He was a professional dancer, obviously. And all the people I've ever worked with, I've always worked with close friends and family because you can trust them. You know, you, you, you're in the same bed a lot of the time. You're in the back of a camper van. You're moving from pitch to pitch. It's got to be someone who you really love as a person, yeah. whether that be male or female, you've got to love them. And yeah. I've loved all my perf performers and all the partners I've worked with. We've not all stayed good friends. Some of are now, you know, don't like me at all. But unfortunately, that's the way life goes. But for this guy, Andre, he was brilliant. He was Italian. Uh, he was from Trieste. And, um, you know, we had a lot of good times on the road doing what we did. And fortunately, um, because with Andre, he, he always felt he should have been paid more because he did more in the show. But my opinion was I realized, Andre, that physically you did more, you know, because he did breakdancing. He did Michael Jackson. He did this. I said, Andre, we're doing those parts because you can do them and because you want to do them. We're using this platform as an opportunity. You want to do the breakdancing. But I said, I still understand that the formula of the masks is what pays us. And it, it was, you know, it was the, the, the mask. But you the wrote mask. the show. You wrote yeah, the show. Like, this, He's this performing within show. a show you wrote. And yeah. I, at the same time, I have my regrets of the way I dealt with Andre because I've never been great at my management. You know, and, and at times, you know, the things I said probably could have hurt his feelings. I wouldn't have handled it in the best way. Not I would have handled it better now than then, for sure, in hindsight. But the sentiment was that this is my show, mate. If you don't like it, I'll get someone else. I've had about 15 partners before you. I'll have another 15 after you. If you don't like it, piss off. You know, and, and that was, you guys, that was the ruthless way you guys, it. yeah. And you guys went through Europe. And I, I, from what I've heard, at least, and, you know, give as much as you want to give for this. You guys parted way in Europe, right? Well, we decided whilst on the road in Britain to do Italy's Got Talent because he was Italian. It made sense. You know, we've got a way in. We said, why not? So we contacted them. The mistake from the start was he had total control because he was the one in always in communication with the producers. And they straight away said, yes, we'd like you to do it. We want you to do the masks of them. And he, he choreographed it. He did a brilliant job. Everything about it, the music, the DJ, and I mean, he had a lot of, he had a big skill set from the music, the choreography, and also, most importantly, he knew the characters who we were going to be portraying, who we were going to be wearing. I didn't, so I couldn't do the nuances or the dances or take the piss out of them. I didn't know who they were, you know, and he did. But when we did it and we made it through to the live finals, the actual finals this time, not just the semi finals, we made it through to the finals. Um, 
at that stage, I thought full and well, this is going to be another Britain's Got Talent. We're going to get so many bookings across in Italy and in Europe that we'll be, we'll have so much bookings. It'd be amazing. But I didn't realize that one of the downsides of Italy's Got Talent is it's, it's on a, it's on a TV station. Um, and at the time, they have no, they don't put any of their videos on YouTube. So there is no viral aspect to their videos. If you're not watching it on media set on that night, you don't see it again. So for the people who watched it, it was great. They enjoyed it. But after that, there was no viral. Whereas with Britain's Got Talent, within days, we had millions and millions of views. I think it's got about 30 or 40 million views now. But there was none of that. And we didn't know that. That was just a, a, a bad luck, you know. And also, I didn't realize that in, in Italy, people tend to, for, for weddings and that kind of thing and bar mitzvahs, they're more likely to hire a string quartet than they are a bunch of goofy guys with masks on. taking. The it's a traditional the kind of thing. It's a traditional kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that, by the by, we did well, got the finals. But just before we went to the final, just before there, we had a falling out. Again, it was over money. Again, it was over um Andre wanting more, probably deserving more. You know, my brother will, will support me in this. And he always told me for years, he says, look, if you're going to do a double act, it's got to be 50-50. If it's not 50-50, it's going to be problems. And I could never have that. I was like, this is mine. This is my baby. Why would I? Why would I? I've only ever had my girlfriend or my brother or my partner. But he said, look, if you're going to do it professionally and consider yourself a performer you, as, a, as a double act, you, it's got to be equal. You've got to be bringing equal things to the table. Otherwise, it's going to turn sour. And he was right, which he is on a lot of things. And, yeah. uh, you know, it, and it turned sour. I didn't pay him what he wanted. And after, straight after Italy's Got Talent, I looked online on Facebook to see how many messages we had, and I was locked out the account. He'd ambushed the account, and I couldn't see anything. To this day, I have no access to the Italy's Got Talent Facebook account. And he only did, I think, a gig or two with his brother and never got any others. You know, I've typed it in and looked online, and there's no evidence of any uh, wrongdoing in Italy, but not through lack of try, and he, that's what he tried to do. And so after what, that, Was I correct was, in thinking that... Um that he took the show and he moved on with the show and basically took what you could describe as your intellectual property and, and tried to use that. Am I correct? In yeah, he, exactly. He didn't, he didn't actually yeah. move it along. Um, he just tried to do some gigs with it and that was it. But I put out a statement on the Facebook page for it's not the Facebook on our website in Italy, in Italian, sorry, explaining what he'd done. And so I think anyone who wanted to book us who go in there could see what he'd done and say, look, we're not taking any bookings anymore. That's, it is what it is, you know. And it was sad because it was the end of a friendship. It was the end of a, a great partner. And for me, again, it was it was another learning curve for me of, look, this is if you're going to do this, this is how you got to you got to do it differently. But I didn't learn. And then I did Arabs Got Talent yeah. <laughs> with another guy. <laughs> okay. This, and, um, because I got a new partner, you know, a great performer, this uh, Egyptian guy, and he was amazing. He would do literally flips with the mask on and still stay in the two dimensional frame. It was like, wow, with the queen. And so he was great. A guy called Mido, and we had some good times together, you know, did a bit of busking. And again, because he was the guy doing the flips, he felt he should be getting much more money. You know, when you it's and it's different in Boston when you've got a bag of cash and that's yours. And then you go, cheers, mate. There's yours. He physically sees it. It's different if you work in a shop. The shop could take 20 grand in a day and you get your 50 or 60. You don't go to the guy because you just don't. It's there's not that. But when street performing, it's so intimate, so close. He's holding the bag while people are putting it in. And it's just not the right way to do it, you know, and I did it wrong again. But this was a weird one. Again, he had the control. He was speaking Arabic to the producers, getting us into Arabs Got Talent. And I'd lost my passport. I'd lost it at the European Championships. I was doing the Masters now. I was over 35, so I was back in athletics, which, which is where I got, had my most success between the ages of 35 and, and now, basically. Which is um, for an athlete, it's kind of like you, you're a. It's like being an old age pensioner, at thirty five as is. an athlete, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, totally, totally. But for me, when I found out that there was such thing as the Masters athletics, like the Masters golf or the Masters um, tennis, I was like, I was hooked. I was like, so there's a chance I can compete again. And the hills are slightly lower. I'm in. 
Um, and I did well. I got two world records, six European titles, two world titles. You got a, you got world records. Congratulations! Yeah, mate. I've got a couple of world records, been... and um, had, again had the most fun I've ever had in athletics in the last five years because you you are going away with a bunch of people who all are paying to be in that sport. No one's getting paid in masters athletics, so it's you are passion. Passion, you are purely there. No one's yeah. got any aspirations. Of I, I hate to do this because I know you're so happy to talk about this, but I'm going to drag you back to Aaron's yeah, Got drag Talent. It back, uh, drag it back. It was yeah. just making the reference because while I was at the Europeans, I'd lost my passport. Yeah. I was in the process of getting it yeah. sorted. And I said to, we were literally days away from flying to Beirut. And I said to Mido, I'm really sorry. I uh, My passport hasn't come in time. We're going to have to leave it this year. We'll do it next year. It'll be great. I promise you, I'm so sorry. And I felt terrible. It was totally my fault. Passport hadn't arrived and he was really pissed off, you know. So we didn't speak for a bit, but it hadn't, wasn't in bad terms. But then a few, yeah. about a few weeks later, I just had a bad feeling, a really bad feeling. And I got in contact with him and he was really aggressive, really aggressive. You've done this, blah, blah, blah. I thought this is weird. So I, very luckily, I've got a cousin who lives in Dubai. He, he's a rights lawyer. And with it being Middle East, Arabs got talent. I said, Mark, can you do me a big favor? I said, I, I think I've got a feeling that this guy has gone on Arabs Got Talent. I think he's taken the act with someone else. He's told me he's not. And I think they've done it. Can you find out if he's done it? He got in touch. He said, he got back. He said, yeah, they have. He says, he's flown over. He's told them that you can't make it. He's trained up another guy. The guy he's trained up's amazing. He's amazing. They've smashed it. They're into the finals. So I was like, oh, man. Here we go again. So he said, what do you want me to do? I said, well, let me think about this. I'll go back to him. Because I didn't know whether to go, look, let's work this out. Just give me a cut. You guys are clearly going to make a fortune because the gigs in the Middle East are big money. You know, they've got a lot of lot of cash in Kuwait and places. They're big money. I thought, do I cut off my nose to spite my face? Do I, do I take a cut but give them total power? Or do I just get them kicked out? You know, and I tried to contact him i said look let's agree on a cut and he just wasn't having any of it he wasn't having this is my show this is my show this is mine i've done this i thought there's no reasoning with them so unfortunately i i said to mark look you're gonna have to get them cut out you know and that's what happened they got cut out the show again never spoke to that guy again and started by this time to learn the lesson it usually takes roughly about 50 to 60 times before i learn a lesson so by this time i've learned right you can't trust anyone with your intellectual property you know even when you've got contracts because even if you've got contracts drawn out unless you've got the money to follow it through in a court of law and sue these people they're just going to take the piss you know because they know you're not going to follow it through anyway you've so, got to you enforce know, it you've got to and I'm, at yeah. this time i'm starting to think and ip is such a hard thing anyway right? yeah it's hard to prove look you know even though you've got that you're the first guy on tv who's done this with masks and you can prove that you were the guy who came up with the idea it's so hard. How do you how you can't copyright biting cardboard masks, you know? I mean, as as well also as well, I think it's slightly short sighted by the chap as well that you know, you've you've introduced him to the concept. The least he could do, to be fair, is to give you a thank you, to get you a drink from it, if you understand what I mean. Yeah. To use colloquial terms. It was just too alpha it was you know, too alpha male so, clashing clashing what, horns and two egos clashing and i found that to be the case with and by the time i realized this lesson in many i'd already made a lot of mistakes in life but for me which is why i do the show i do now alone with my partner with my girlfriend emma because you just i just i just clash with other guys you know it's it's two people competing for attention and yeah. you know it's just one of those things unfortunately well, maybe, maybe I, I'm not sure of the situation. Maybe it's two alpha males. Maybe it's the nature of the business. You know, who knows? But what I, what I do know is that something happened to you shortly after that that was probably quite life-changing. Am I correct in thinking that? Well, after after Arabs got talent, uh, remember this point, we're talking 2014 here, 2014. Um um, you know, like I say, I'm back into the Masters Athletics. By this point... And let's say again, really, it's worth repeating, two world records, right? Two world, two world two records. World record. Two, world, two record. world records. Be proud, mate. Smile. Thank, two you, world, thank you, mate. Two world records. Fucking amazing. Uh, two world you. records. Um, appreciate that. Um, but, but, but this time, I will add that 
through trying to do to trying to, to run before I could walk, to trying to grow too quickly in the business during a recession. I'd taken on too and many this debts. Is, this, is the, this is the property business. This is the property business. By taking on too many debts, all sorts, lots of things, lots of factors, we messed up, you know? Mm. And at that point in 2012, I was personally made bankrupt by a guy who, an investor who I couldn't personally pay back in the time scale where he needed his money back. And he said, look, I'm going to bankrupt you. I said, if you bankrupt me now, I'll lose everything because I've given everyone, all the investors who did lent us money, I'd not just given them my word. I'd said, look, if this goes belly up, I'm going to lose my flat in Covent Garden, which is, I think it's worth about 1.5 million now, 30 houses, I lose all them. And I'd given them, I'd given them all this as security. And he said, look, I don't care. I'm going to, I'm pushing the button. So in 2012, May 2012, I was personally made bankrupt and I lost all of it. The whole lot, whole lot got taken off, went into receivership. My cousin the same. He lost everything as well. Um, and is that because you just you couldn't you couldn't service the 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 upkeep yeah. of everything? We couldn't. We we got almost. We had to get in terms of doing what's called an IVA, a voluntary agreement, where you basically we wanted to ring fence the assets. We wanted to put them in some sort of ring fence fund that we could say, look, that's yours. They are your properties. We've promised. And you that's that. For, that was for the investors, right? For the investors, we promised. Yeah. My flat, my own home, they all of it. You can have all of it because if you keep them. The rental income alone will service the debt. The equity will definitely service the debt. But if you try to sell them now, today in 2012, on the current price tags, they won't get the money back. You know, you've got to, it's got to be done in the right way. And we had to, we tried to get everyone to agree to a longer plan. But some of them, were, by this point, they'd lost trust. They'd lost belief. And they just said, look, you know, this one particular person said, we're going to, in fact, it was a group of them. A group of them, they went under the one guy, but a group of them, funded together to pay the 600 quid or whatever it is to bankrupt myself and Davey and unfortunately that stage yeah they went into receivership we lost or we had they lost their investment uh, we lost our homes we lost everything and we had to start again so for me in 2012 that was again when you when I, when I started uh, more street perform and got back into it yeah. and realized all along wow I'd, I'd never I must say I'd never lo- enjoyed the property I never enjoyed it. I did it because having amassed a portfolio at Loughborough, again, just to service, to give, to allow me to train for athletics, just a means to an end. I didn't want to be a landlord, didn't want to be a property developer. I was an athlete, an entertainer. That was enough. But I never would have taken any advice or listened to someone if they'd said, hey, Liam, listen, you love athletics. Guess what? You can do it forever. You can do the master's athletics. You can do it till you're 70 or 80. You can do it for as long as you want entertaining guess what Liam you could do it forever and you'll make as much money as you want to make I was never money oriented even I never even decorated the flat in Covent Garden it was as basic as can be I just loved finding out what I was capable of you know finding well, out a word I used before or a phrase used for means to an end it was always a means to an end right but you know even even beyond in terms of I mean in terms of pushing as far as we did I could have stuck with five properties and that would have paid very handsomely for me to do athletics and do the things I love to do. But for me, I wanted to find out if we can do five, why not do 10? If you can do 10, why not do 20? Why not? And then when you go to London, you meet people who've got a portfolio of 600 houses and you feel about that small, you think, Christ, we need to aim higher. You need to aim higher. And you and you're someone, looking for personal best. You're competing. You're again, looking right? for personal best. You're competing. And yet it's suddenly you're against them. I used to feel this big in Loughborough. Now I'm that small in London. And it is again. It's a it's a testosterone thing. It's a male thing. It's a it's a I want to be better than you. And it's all the wrong reasons to do something. You should do property because you yeah. love property. You should do yeah. busking because you love busking. You should never do something just because hey that'll make me money. And we ended up being in a business neither of us wanted to be in, but we thought hey we can really do well in this. You know we can really do well in the student industry which wasn't being done well. It was being done really badly by slum yeah. landlords. And we tried to. Make it better, yeah. but again, unfortunately, we failed. And inve- and uh, people judged you about this. Are you, are you happy to talk about that? Are you happy to talk about the people who may have judged you for for the business you had? Yeah, I mean, it's you know whatever opinion they had is the is is the right opinion because it's based on the information I'm, I'm, they I have. I mean by that, like know? there was there was like um, 
yeah there was there was organizations perhaps or bodies government bodies that may have at some point i mean i i don't want to put you in a hole so i'm trying to be you don't know worry. do you understand uh, where no i yeah. appreciate it. don't worry I'll, I'll navigate around it i'm still right now i'm still on license so i can't talk about everything until after march 2021 but i can talk about a lot of it okay talk about yeah. a lot of it so Okay, so well, uh, talk about as, if you're willing to talk about as much as you can. Yes. And I'll be honest, I've never pissed so much in my life, but I got to piss. I'll be back I'm in not, one second. I'm not, I'm not making you nervous, am I, Matt? <laughs> maybe, maybe. I don't know, like literally, I've done, I've done fifty-two interviews now. I think it's my fifty-third or fifty-fourth. Usually, it's two hours before I got to piss. Oh, it yeah. is two hours. There we go. We're getting there, but nonetheless, please carry on, mate. I got you on headphones. I can hear you. Okay, please. So where where we're at? Uh, 2012, bankrupt, and not not you know at that point it made me actually re- realize that um, one thing my dad always used to say he said suddenly the richest man in the world is not the man who has the most it's the man who needs the least and it it made no sense to me before because before and when I was doing property as well you always feel as a younger guy that you, you are going to need a certain amount of money to be happy. I just never realized how little that was. You just really don't need that much. I mean, I, I now live in my motor home. It's, it's not all that, but it's, it's, I love it. I'm, every night with my partner who I love, it feels like you're having a sleepover with your best friend. And it's, it never, I never get sick of it. It's just something I love to do. It's not everyone's cup of tea and it gets difficult at times, but, this was always my dream. It's just the other stuff got in the way, you know, and a lot of testosterone, a lot of ego, and a lot of trying to trying to make things work. But certainly after 2012, once I got back to street performing, it was a, a very, very difficult time for a long time. I mean, literally from that date on onwards, uh, we tried to do everything we could. We went voluntarily into the police stations to give reports and we didn't need to do. You know, we both went in and did that. And we did the best we could to try and explain to reporters or to government bodies, FSA, uh, financial services, the best we could at why we had made the decisions we'd made. And to cut a long story short, we had taken risks with investors' money that we shouldn't have taken. We didn't think they were risky, but I now realize that a lot of the stuff I do in life I've got a very high tolerance of risk and we shouldn't have expected other people to share a similar tolerance. You know, if we'll go on to what I do now, obviously as a, as a yeah. stunt performer. And was but, the, was the consequence to that? Yeah, obviously the, at the time we knew, we, we, uh, we knew there was an investigation going on. Um, the Northumbria um, police did an investigation. They said it wasn't worth following up. Um, what was it? Um, fraud fraud uk or fraud fraud something did an investigation they didn't think it was worth following up on but there was a small department of the business and commerce section of the um of the crown and they there was a group of investors who took it upon themselves to really try and find out you know what's going on what's going on and they pushed and pushed and you know why not if they if they were they hadn't invested the most money it often is the smaller but they wanted to know what got what had gone on and they didn't believe our full story. And, you know, why, why would they? So 20, wind on the clock. What was it? 2012, we were made bankrupt. 2018, six years later. But remember, we've, we've not done any business since 2010. We get a summons through the door. This is 2018. Saying you're being summons to court on allegations of fraud, misappropriation of investors' finances. There's a list of things they were saying we've done. So me and David spoke on the phone. He'd had the same letter. David lives in Manchester. Yeah. He's, he'd had, he's been doing a printing business for the last, since, since coming out of property in 2010, more or less, and then being made bankrupt 2012. He's been doing a print business. I've been busking. And we've just been getting on. We had no intention of ever getting involved in business or property again. You know, we, we have, it kind of evolved into a situation where we were doing it in a big way, but we never really fully wanted to be in it. So once we got out of it, we were happy to be out of it. And when we got this summons, obviously we got we got uh, legal representative, legal advice, and they looked at it and they said, "Look, we knew straight away at least seven or eight of the points that we're making. We knew we could win on. You know, straight away we said, look, this is just not true. You know, um, and uh, but there was some of them. We said, look, we're gonna. These are a little bit more difficult, 
well, we can fight this. We'll win it. We'll, we'll clear our names, you know. We'll go to court and we'll, we'll have our day in court. And finally, after all this time, we'll be able to put this to bed. Because it was lying in the background, you know. It was all lying in the background yeah. of, of what had happened and how investors had lost their cash and the rest of it. And just to try and explain what well, happened. this kind of worry never leaves you, right? Say again? <clears throat> Say that again, Matt? I said, this kind of worry never leaves you. No, you know, exactly. This, it's, 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 uh, I said, this kind of worry doesn't leave you. Yeah, we always knew there was an investigation going on in the background, but we just thought, you know, it's done. We've lost everything. Investors have lost cash. We've lost everything. It's uh, it's, it's done. If, if we were going to defraud people, we wouldn't have given our own houses up as security and the rest of it. But we always felt like, and we were brought up, both of us brought up by good families, good moral compass, we always felt like at the time we were making the right decision. That's why it's hard for people to say, have you learned your lesson? Have you learned your lesson? If you put yourself in that position with that knowledge and that information, it's easy to look in hindsight what you've done, what you do, because clearly you do stuff differently. Always, everyone would. But at the time, we always felt, are we doing the right thing for everyone, for the investors, for us, for the, everyone? You know, And taking legal advice, spending a lot of money on legal advice, them saying, yes, you're solvent, you know, because we actually had, in 2010, we had a guy who was the, one of the richest guys in the country, a guy called Anthony Lyons, worth about 400 million. He owned Earl's Court, and he just sold Earl's Court. He was very liquid. I went into his office, met him, sat with him, and showed him our track record and what we'd done with properties, what we'd done with other investors. And these, this was all, you know, real legit stuff. And he was really impressed. So as a very rich guy... He had us personally private investigated everything, you know, every stone and, and turn, you know, all the rest of it. And, and it was very happy with the track record we had. And he wanted to invest 20 million pounds a year for five years, a large amount of money. Like 100 million. This was a 100 million pound investment. Wow. So when we had that and he signed the contracts, signed a contract at Mishkondore, one of the biggest law firms in Europe. And he popped corks on his yacht in Cannes. I wasn't first, but, but to celebrate the investment that he was going to be making. This was a major deal for him as well as us. It wasn't chump change for him, even though he's a rich guy. And so when someone signs a contract, 64 to 100 pages deep, which they've paid 100 grand for, you think they're very real about this. You know, they're going to do it. And we did three houses for them. He bought them. We renovated them. We saw, we tenanted them. We sold them. We got the returns. We took our profits. All done. Surpassed the expectations. And all the time... We had a debt from a previous company, okay, which we were carrying. But in our minds, the way we saw it was the profits from this fund we're going to be doing for the next five years, we're never going to have a problem with the debt levels that we've got. So in terms of in terms of assessing the risk levels, I guess you gauge it from how you feel in your stomach. You know, are you losing sleep at night? Do you feel, hey, can you pay down your debt, Slim? Absolutely. Are investors going to get paid back? Definitely. Okay. Are we all good? Absolutely. Are we solvent? Yep. Crack on. Are we doing the right thing? Morally, ethically, are we doing the right thing? Okay. Then when you get accused of fraud and they say, Liam, and this is what happened. We were literally ready in 2019, last year in June, to go to court, to fight it, to clear our names. And we had a, I had a, I had a good barrister and a good lawyer, a good uh, solicitor. And my barrister said, look, Liam, they do this exercise where they, they blindside you. They give you a hard time to see how you'll stand up in court. And he said, Liam, did the investors who lent you money, did they all know your exact debt level? And I said, if they asked, I would tell them everything that we've got. I would explain, etc. But I wouldn't volunteer the information because it might have affected the sale. And I didn't feel it was I wasn't a limited company. I didn't feel I was legally obliged to tell them all my accounts because we're a partnership. And he said, well, that's fraud. I went, is it? He he said, I said, I didn't mean to deceive or intend to harm anyone. He says, I'm not saying you set this out to defraud people, but if you go to a court next week and these people who were in their 60s when they invested are now in their 70s and they've lost, some of them have lost their life savings because of you. And if they, if you, if you go in there and they say they weren't aware of the debt you had, which they will all say, I think you will be found guilty and you'll be facing seven to nine years. And I couldn't believe it. You know, I was like, I looked at Davey and both of us, you know, he's got two children. I'm lucky that at the moment, at the time that I didn't have any children. And we just we said, we need a, a minute here, you know. And they said, so we, we would like to compromise the position. We would like to come up 
deal where you accept a smaller amount and you'll you'll face a smaller amount. We say, hang on a minute. I've never been in trouble with the police in my life. I've never been arrested. For the last 10 years, I've been a busker. He's been a picture framer. You know, we've got references from the Olympic Association. I mean, we've not touched on it yet, but for two of these years, I've been on the British bobsleigh team, trying to do my best in everything I've ever done. But he says, yes, but at that time, had you told them your debt levels, they don't have your tolerance to risk. They might not have invested. If, you, if they might have gone, whoa, even if you have got a fund to pay it, I'm out. And you never gave them that chance. You made that decision for them. And that is technically, in the eyes of the law, that's a fraud. And so from then, we started to talk about, I mean, we were in bits, you know, because at this point, they were, it's looking like, look, it's highly likely that when it comes to sentencing, We'll have to agree to, to, uh, to something here, but it's highly likely that we're going to get time. Of course. So at that point... Well, seven to nine days, years is li it's life over kind of time, isn't it, you know? Well, you, you serve half, so it would be you get nine, you serve four and a half, you might get... And then you're out on tag after four. So, But it's still... You know, Davy's kids are going to be seven, eight, you know, when he comes out. And uh, this is... This is, you know, this is crazy. Your head's just spun head's gone you're in this horrible courtrooms and at that point we had to come up with it and before this had happened a few days before the prosecution uh, lawyer his mum had died and he had thrown the towel and he says I'm, I'm giving in I'm not just on the case I'm not doing this anymore the whole law thing he stepped out so a junior barrister had been put in now this junior barrister didn't know the case didn't know the ins and outs and so we thought this was a good thing we thought but if we go to trial, our lawyers will, will bounce them around the room. And our lawyers said, yes, but Judge Cross, who's a very fair judge, but he's very stern. He will take the side of the junior every opportunity to help him through this because he'll be aware that he won't know the course, the case inside out. And you're up against... He's not going to give him leeway. You're up against the judge then. You're not just going to be able to... We're not going to be able to hammer him like we could hammer a top lawyer, a top barrister, because it's fair game then. He says, we're going to have to be cautious and the judge is going to take sides, etc. He says this, in our professional opinion, you should take a deal and, you know, let's work on a great mitigation package. So we get your references together and we explain to the judge that you guys are, are, are two guys who for the last 10 years have done great with your lives. You're upstanding members of the community. You know, you, you help anyone who you, you can and you're good people. You know, you, you, this is this is a mistake you've made. And you know that we realize there's going to be repercussions but let's let's try and if we can get the sentences under 24 months then you may suspend it so we th we went two weeks later we went into sentencing having pleaded guilty to fraud we then went into sentencing for them to say um, and to try and get it under that 24 months and our lawyers did a good job davy's lawyers did a, a really good job too and he got it down he said you know uh, and and he, it, we got halfway through it was quite a long day and uh, he said, we're going to pause it there. We are going to carry on tomorrow. But for tonight, you guys will be taken off to the cells. That was the first night we got took off to Strangeways, which is a Victorian prison, which is just like you see in the films. It's grim, you know. We, as soon as I got in there, you're in a cell. Where you're in with murderers. People are being exchanged from one place to the other. Rapists, terrorists, everyone, you know. And there's, there's rats running along underneath, literally, uh, where the canteen area was. And we were in there for a night, but we're still thinking the next day, hey, Davey, you know, I think we'll, we could get this under 24 months tomorrow. He sounded like he was in our favor. You know, he, he took the references on board. We might be okay. You know, we might get community service, an opportunity to do something decent for the community, for the, you know, whatever. Because we were, and then, you know... Because we, we, after all, you puzzled. guys been... By the sounds of it, you didn't act in bad faith. You know, you were, you were trying to, trying to make it work. You were never, you weren't, you weren't trying to steal people's money. You were trying to get on top of things and make things work. We never. You just got, you yeah. got kind of. We didn't. We didn't feel we needed. Yeah. To. We'd, we'd, we'd had a successful business, which many arms of it had done really well, doing all the right things. We never felt like the need. Certainly, we're just not the type of people to set up a fraud, to deceive people, to take old people's money. It's not us, you know. I'd rather die than, than cause someone else yeah. that sort of harm, you know. But it, you, you believed you were acting in good faith at all times. We did. But there was times looking back now when we look back and go, you know what? 
I'm not going to sit here and make excuses. We just shouldn't have taken the risks that we took, regardless of any fund, regardless of any rich guy, regardless of any contract signed. The deal's never done till it's done. And you took chances which not only might they not have took, but that they weren't aware of. They weren't aware of all the risks. If you'd explained all the risks, yeah. they might have still invested, but at least they'd have all known them, you know? And so that is that is fraud, and yeah, that's it's not right, you know. And and what we got, yeah, fair enough, to, mate. You know, it's a. It's and a, so, you know, so the next day, that. you spend the night in the cells. We spend a night in the yeah, cells. Yeah, fair enough, next, mate. It's fair enough. Day, you, you'd seem like someone who has a lot of remorse over this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've had. We haven't just. This is the thing. We didn't just have jail to think about what we'd done. We had the last ten years after losing everything to the. You know, you know, nights of. Uh, sleeping in, in a van and, and having lost everything. And now I love sleeping in a van. It's what I do by choice. But at the time when you're sleeping in a van because you've lost everything, because you literally have your items in a bin bag and you've lost, you've had, you, at this point, you've gone from being someone who nearly made the Olympics. You've been in the live finals of talent shows and Italy's got talent, France has got talent, Arabs got talent, Britain's got talent. You've got, you know, endless CVs and athletics and you've got mad ambitions and suddenly none of it means shit. You know, at this point now, you have got to rebuild from scratch and you've got to you've got to put your energies into something that's gonna do good but not cause other people problem, you know. Take risks by all means with your own life, with your own body, with your own money, but don't take risks with other people's, you know. And uh, we had lots of Yeah. Time. And so day two in court. Two seconds a minute, Matt. I've just gotta see if I'm is okay. Yeah. Okay? No worries, mate. Are you okay? Two seconds done. Um, we're working Coventry tomorrow, so um, we can't be too late. But we're we're, um, we're in Birmingham today. But I, I want to tell you about this anyway because it's relevant. But um, we um, yeah, we we we, yeah. we we made the wrong things. But we went, we came back the next day thinking we might have a fair crack at it. But the law, the the judge, when he started reading it out, it was like, oh, you know, and reading out the witness statements. That was the win thing that got us the witness statements from the people who'd lost the money to see how our decisions had affected their lives. Now. Granted, some of them may have been exaggerated through the venom and, you know, wanting to put us behind bars. But even if they were exaggerated, it's only then really you start to think, wow, you know, you, you don't think you don't. You just don't know how you've affected other people at those stages in your life. And and then he said, you know, unfortunately, he says, I can see there's no been any um, has been no selfish gains. It's been there's no Rolexes, no fancy lavish parties has been no and they literally went through every single account statement for 10 years that there's been no spending on yourselves so we understand this is not the normal yeah. fraud but it is still deception and for that reason i've got to give you 21 months of which you'll serve six and a half seven months in in jail and then it was the hammer down and off we were took in a sweat box handcuffed and off to prison you know and uh, can, can i can i just say i have done a little bit of research on this before we interviewed and the judge did did say that you were two gentlemen of good character. And I think that's worth stating that the judge did say that. He looked through and he thought you were people of good character and it wasn't that you were people of bad character, but maybe you'd made mistakes and risks as you talked about. So yeah, you, you went in, you did six months. Like, how was that? Horrible. Just the, I mean, you can probably imagine what it would be like, because it is literally like what you see on a film, the cell, the routine, the awful, food and the, the the lack of freedom you just got from having been someone who's gone see you later athletics um see you later business in 2010 12 and hello to a life of freedom of this bohemian life of living in a van traveling around doing the things you love around the people you choose to be around and suddenly to have all of that taken to be away from your partner uh, who was very much you know my support but also was dependent in many ways on my support to her um, and to be split up and be put behind bars, especially when um, at the stage where you felt, you know, we've had 10 years now. If this happened in 2013, we might have had time to think about what we've done. But we've had so long to think about what we've done and try to put our lives right and make amends in any way we can. That how are we going to benefit? How are we, what are we going to take? What are we going to try and how are we going to try and evolve? What are we going to learn? You know, what are we going to try and do? So we just, both of us just tried to throw ourselves into as much reading, educating. It was very frustrating because we wanted to do courses. We wanted to try and make use of the time to from it, but it's just, it's just not a lot you can. So you've just got to, 
you really do you do a lot of gym a lot of training in the gym every day we were both gym orderlies we had gym jobs you know so you were there and it was basically a cleaners job mopping and cleaning and the rest of it and it, it was just a it brought it, it just every day where you, th- you thought it couldn't bring you down another notch it would find a way to bring you down another notch and another notch and another notch and just um and the people you meet as well in there you know it, what you learn so much about how the people who you think are the the, the worst representatives of humanity and you you you're sitting with them and chatting to them and they're just people they're just people who've made mistakes just people who've got it wrong you know i'm not saying be in the wrong place wrong time i mean just made bad decisions you know people who a guy who a guy who was at his sister's wedding someone started on him hit the guy killed him and because he hit him again when he was on the ground got lifed off lifed off the next day police at his door taken to jail serving nine years he was our barber lovely guy crack and blow you know genuinely nice made a bad choice but shouldn't have hit him when he was down you get one chance, self-defense, one punch. If you hit him when he's down, you're going under. You're going down. It's you not know, self-defense it's no more. Not self-defense. So, uh, you know, but the amount yeah. of people. You and so, to... I mean, we could dwell. We could talk. We could talk for two and a half hours about this in itself. You know, um, we could talk about two and a half hours about this by itself. But I'd like to, in the limited time we have, because you got to go to Coventry tomorrow. I'm, the, I'm there now. Actually, um, in the van. We're in the park, car park. <laughs> And, uh, well, let's say this. you've got, got to work, work Coventry, Coventry tomorrow. tomorrow. And I know Coventry. Yeah. I grew up in the Midlands. Not the most welcome environments in the world. Love you, Coventry. Um, what was your life like after you got out then? How did you start rebuilding uh, yourself and your life and who you are? Well, I got out in December the, the 9th, 2019. So I came out. I was on tag, which meant I had a tag around my ankle. And all I wanted to do, all I fantasized about when I was in there was getting out and getting back in the van and getting some momentum. Because before going in, I just started to get momentum. It was the first time, really, I'd ever been doing something which I thought, this is me. This is me. Traveling around, doing the shows, doing the show that I was doing now, which wasn't dancing anymore. I was now doing a show which I was sick of doing a double. I was sick of relying on people all the time. I wanted my own thing. And I didn't have juggling skills. I didn't have tightrope skills, slack rope. So I designed a show based on what I could do, which was hurdling, you know. So I've got three hurdles, all different degrees in jagged material, which, you know, we've got knives, we've got spears, we've got fire. And trying to get through these things with a blindfold, without the blindfold, in a way that you think, I could only do this if we'd done this professionally, you know. And so I think maybe that's why I did athletics. Maybe it was leading me to this. This is what I'm about, doing these shows and getting paid finally to be an athlete, you know, the final, that's how I feel. It's like every time I go out tomorrow, it's like going out and performing. It's like going out and competing and you come home and it doesn't matter what you've got in the hat, you know, with the amount of great feedback you get, just that feeling of having 70 people come up and going, you just made my day versus having 70 investors going, where's my money? That difference is it's just, it's, it's so, it's so rewarding, you know, to be able to, to get that from something you love. Not everyone gets the chance to do yeah. it. And of course, a hurdling, a hurdler's skill is totally redundant when you retire, unless you teach it. And I'm just blessed to be able to still use the skill. So when I came out in December, it was straight back in the van. Um, it was going back into Newcastle. I couldn't go far because I was on tag. I was on curfew. I had to be in for seven o'clock every night. But I was straight back out working. And so you had to be in a residence. I was at my mum and dad's up in Newcastle. So staying up there, it was great that they okay. let me stay there because they, they'd been through a hell of a lot whilst I was inside. Uh, but they were really supportive. Yeah. You know, my partner was supportive when I came out and, you know, it was great to see her again. And and we just got back to work. And then just just when we'd, I'd, I'd invested um, loads of time, loads of effort and energy and getting new props, get my van sorted because it had deteriorated a bit. And just when we're ready to go out, bang, lockdown, pandemic, the whole world, the whole world's <laughs> locked down. I'm like, this is a nightmare. It's a total nightmare. <clears throat> just to the point where I'm ready to start building the momentum again and bang. So after that, it was just lockdown, you know, just work on the skills, try to uh, work on the show, try to work on some bits and pieces, listen to your podcast, listen to some of the great performers of how they're doing it. Um, a lot of Al's stuff, you know, on the stuff he's doing, Al Miller and looking yeah. at his stuff. And 
and just thinking about getting back out again. And finally, on the 7th, I think it was, of July this year, when they said, look, performers can start to go out again, albeit in a responsible way. Since then, I've just been working really meticulously and tirelessly of just trying to arrange the crowd and trying to do things in a way which are COVID friendly. And we're just, just getting there now. Well, I'll say this again, Liam. I've said it a couple of times with different things. Um, two big shows you've created in your life, The Faces of Disco, and now this Hurgle in Danger show where you're jumping through knives and fire and spears. You're someone as a performer that's, that's done something original in all the steps you've done. And you're doing original work again. And all power to you. All, all power to you in the future to go do your shows around the UK and the world and create something which is different and interesting from your own perspective. You're, you're a gentleman which has in every sphere of your life been driven. Mistakes you may have made along the way aside, you've been a driven person. You've tried to go for your personal best. And I wish you the best of luck, mate. I genuinely do. I appreciate that, Matt. I really do. And uh, I think for, cool, for me at the minute, I'm just working on... My show's a very short show, you know. It's only about 10, 12 minutes. So tomorrow I'll be repping them out and uh, trying to do as many as possible. But uh, at some stage, maybe get a little bit longer, start to do the festival scene and start to travel again. Once I, once I get off license in March, um, I can travel again. So plan is to go abroad, maybe go to Europe yeah. and uh, see some new pictures. Cool. Well, Liam, I wish you the best of luck with with this um i'm gonna let you uh, go to sleep with your partner i'm gonna let you prepare for coventry tomorrow uh is there anything else you'd like to say to everyone else who's watching i just wanted to say to you a big thank you uh because what you're doing as well is a really great thing you're getting really great at it and it's given the opportunity to so many people who um either present or past who've been street performers to to create a thing, to create like, you know, this, this, uh, this critical mass of what it means to be a street performer. It's a sideline. We're always on the fringe of society and not many people know the grind. Not many people know the, the intricacies and how much you go through to just get to that, that stage of being able to deliver something that makes people smile and to give us a voice finally. And I know you're going to be branching out onto other platforms and that hopefully there could be some grants and all sorts of things we've talked about, which you absolutely deserve. And, you know, just to try and build what you've got. Um, and we should all, we should all be helping you in any way we can. Cause it's, it's going to be, it, it's, it's a one of a kind, you know, same thing, You're doing some original stuff. And I know it's stopping you from performing as well. You've got to get back and get some uh, shows. In fact, I want to get you on the road with me. Sometime. Slowly, slowly. Yeah. Slowly, yeah. Slowly. Well, I'd love that. And uh, we've been talking about PSPOs and uh, we've talked briefly about antisocial crime behavior, behavior and policing bill, which is an awful bill made in 2014, which yeah. maybe you'll see us deal with in the future. Um, Liam, I'll definitely uh, do some videos with you when we do. For now, everybody who's watched, thank you. Thank you for watching. Uh, Liam, thank you for talking. You've been honest and you've, you've shared more than 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 most people would share and I really appreciate it. Thank you for putting your story in the Yeah, archive, you're welcome. Mate. I spoke to I spoke um, to my probation officer this morning to say, Am I all right doing it? And he said he said you can, but just be careful what you say. Don't name any names and stuff. So I hope I haven't landed myself in any um in any grey or muddy waters. But I, I Well think, well I don't think fig so. fingers crossed we haven't breached your probation <laughs> order. Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. Everybody, thank you for watching. Um check you soon. Everybody, goodbye. Thanks very much. Goodbye. Mate. No idea sense.